And Mayor, you may begin. All right, great. Um, since we're with the public online, I'd like to know, I would like to now call the April 13th, 2021 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Can we please start a roll call, with a roll call? Mayor Bagley, I see you are here. Indeed. Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Edelgo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, I'll lead us off with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the, the United States, United of, America. States of, America. of America and to the to republic, republic which stands, which stands, stands a nation, nation, a nation under God, under God, God indivisible, 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 liberty, liberty and justice, justice, and justice for all. Justice. All right, just a quick reminder to the public, anyone wishing to provide public comment during the public invited to be heard must go ahead and watch the live stream of the meeting and call in um, when public comment is made available. You'll call that number. Follow the information on the screen, and then everyone will have three minutes to speak. Unfortunately, the chair will have to cut you off three minutes, no matter how much I love or hate what you're saying. So, all right, let's go ahead. Do we have an a motion to approve the minutes of March 30th, 2021, a regular session meeting? Councilmember so Christensen? So moved. Second. All right, it was moved by Councilmember Christensen, second by Councilmember Hidalgo Faring. Seeing no revisions, dialogue, or debate. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Do we have any agenda revision, submission of documents, or motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas? All right, seeing none, let's go on to the city manager's report on COVID-19. Harold. Um, Mayor Council, actually, I'm going to ask Eugene to join us today um, and talk about the changes that are going to be taking place in terms of um, the state rules and the county rules. Um, the county adopted um, their new order last night. The governor's made some changes, and so I wanted Eugene to, to take a, a, a second to really ground us on what the world's going to look like now as we move forward for the coming month. And then I'll just um, have some just quick updates on high level on where we are in vaccination. Next week, Lexi's going to be here, and she can really provide you with uh, more detailed information on the vaccine piece. And uh, by then, Carmen's going to have some information about how um, we may use you all as you work talking to your constituents to help us ensure we're getting people into the system. That'll be next week. Eugene, do you want to talk about all the changes that are happening this week? Sure thing, Harold. Uh, Eugene May, city attorney. Uh, so last week, I previewed with council that we were expecting some big changes this week in the dial. And uh, it's starting to come into focus now uh, what our next couple of months are going to look like. Uh, today at uh, Governor Polis's press conference, he announced that the dial is going to go away on Friday, the state level dial, and not be replaced by anything else uh, except for large indoor events. Think nuggets, abs, those sort of you know, thousands of people indoors. I, I think the state is still going to have some involvement to make sure those are conducted safely. Uh, on a separate independent track, the masking order, the public indoor space mask order is still in effect at the state level. And that was adopted on April 2nd and good for 30 days. So we can expect that to um, continue. Uh, the real movement was last night, uh, the Boulder County Board of Health adopted a new public health order, uh, in general, adopting the state dial framework. And uh, it's going to be effective on Friday, the 16th, and there's two phases. The first phase, uh, starting on Friday, uh, the county will go down one level, and we're firmly in yellow, so, you know, by all expectations we're going to be in blue come Friday that uh, first phase will last for one month uh, not moving around we will stay in blue and most of the capacity restrictions in the state dial are going to be applicable in level blue so I think that uh, really reflects being responsive to the input they've heard from stakeholders and businesses that we don't want the dial you know jiggering around and going between levels so we're going to be firmly in blue for the for a month. Um, 
you know, they still have 22 industry specific uh, categories with different capacity levels. Uh, a couple of highlights, restaurants can operate at 100% capacity with six foot distancing. That's really a theme that's throughout all of their capacity restrictions. Still want people to distance, still gonna mask um, and try to keep with your own households. Offices and retail generally at 75% capacity. Um, and then on down the list uh, for the different types of industry categories. Um, for large outdoor events, uh, greater than 500 people, uh, the county is requesting that uh, organizers submit plans to Boulder County Public Health. No approval is required to conduct that event. Boulder County Public Health wants to have the opportunity uh, to have notice and review to make sure that mitigation measures are adequate for that size of event. Uh, come May 15th, it, we will move into phase two for three months. There is a new level clear, which um, has no restrictions, no capacity restrictions, but it's level clear with a snapback provision, which if our hospitalization rate increases, then we would move to the appropriate level based upon our hospital admissions. And they changed it from a raw number to a rate per 100,000 uh, uh, for seven consecutive days on a 14 day rolling average. So that's really going to sort of even out the peaks and focus on the metric that's most important, which is hospital capacity here. Incident rates is being taken out, number of cases per day. Um, and so, you know, that'll get us into the fall and, you know, hopefully everything will be going uh, well by then. Uh, Boulder County did reserve the right to move the county to a different level if, you know, circumstances on the ground changes. Uh, on the masking side, um, you know, this is important or relevant to council's desire to get back uh, in person. I think the masking requirement is gonna be the sort of constraining factor under the combination of the state and local masking orders. City council, if they want to be unmasked, I think are speakers to an audience or for broadcast. And therefore you would need to be 25 feet apart from non-household members, so from each other. Uh, that would also apply to staff. You know, I know Harold is typically a speaker and it would require a 25 foot bubble around the podium and things like that. So, uh, you know, based on those logistical challenges, I, I think we would be looking to wait until we're in level clear in May, in the middle of May, uh, before really going in person and then sort of planning maybe on a hybrid or something like that uh, before then because of these distancing requirements. We would also have to manage the public six foot distancing requirements in the audience, the seated event. Um, and I don't think the capacity of city council chambers is over 500 so that that part wouldn't apply. Uh, so that's kind of a high level uh, summary of changes. Happy to answer any questions or have Harold continue on with his COVID update. Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. My question is for uh, non-public uh, meetings such as executive sessions. Uh, would the 25 foot rule, is this specifically a Boulder County issue versus the state? Because obviously we see um, press conferences with the, the governor and other members of his staff and they're within six feet of each other. So I'm just curious, is this is a Boulder County initiative? And it, when we're not it, having uh, public meetings, could we maybe have an in-person meeting? Uh, so yes, the uh, basket, 25 foot basking requirement is a local public health order, uh, Boulder County order applies to speakers, to an audience or for broadcast. Uh, 25 feet apart from non-household members. 
um, for executive sessions, if there isn't an audience or broadcast, uh, the guidance release uh, starts at 10 or more. And so I think there is some flexibility there. Uh, we would have to, I would have to think a little bit harder about if there was just council, no public. Is that, is that what you were? My question asking? was not, my question was not pushing back. It was just clarification. So. But I could look at that. Um, For instance, uh, yes, an executive session meeting would be an example of that. So. Okay. I'll uh, take a look at that a little further. The order just came out this morning uh, and I'll, I'll look at it with that scenario in mind. Councilmember Waters. Well, thanks, Mayor Bagley. <clears throat> just to clarify, early in the pandemic, uh, we agreed that we were going to follow uh, whatever guidance came from the governor. Uh, and I'm trying to recall, did, I think we did that by a vote, did we not? Did we vote to, to follow that direction? Uh, should we assume now that it, relative to, to guidance here, we're not going to get more guidance from the governor? Is that fair assumption or not? And if we don't, do we need to, do we need to then take another formal action on what guidance we're going to follow, follow so we don't, we're not in a debate about uh, distances and protocols and you know, how we're going to move forward? So, so I may not. Well, uh, one thing, Eugene, the I, then I, I may not have been totally precise. The governor did say the dial will stop being regulatory mandates and will just go into guidance status. So we won't know exactly what he has in mind until Friday. And, you know, they, I, I think a lot of the social distancing, say, for outdoors and masking is now recommended, it's not required. And so that may uh, factor into how we want to define who and what we're following. I think part of, I think when we did this, if I'm remembering, we had a couple of conversations. I think council said CDC, governor, CDPHE, and then Boulder County Health in, in that order. We'll have to look at it. The thing that Eugene's talking about that's important is the masking order is still a state order. And so that's the nuance in this in terms of how you sit up and whether or not you have to wear a mask because you could theoretically be in the council meeting together based on the rule, but you have to wear your mask um, as you're setting up the bias throughout that meeting. And so that's part of the nuance of the orders we're trying to figure out. So is it, so you, we can sit next to each other within 25 feet so long as we're masked. And, and then Correct. to be unmasked, we have to be with, with beyond 25, 25 feet. feet. Correct. All right. Well, I'm not going to comment because we could be here forever, but um, it looks like we're going to just be on Zoom meetings for a little while because uh, that's a lot easier than spending time fighting with the, with the county health department. All right. Um, we Harold? think there will be we think there will be clarity in a month. This, I think, is really in between now and May sixteenth. If there's anything in it, our minds, right. starting to say May sixteenth, right in that time frame, is okay. when we come out of it. Well, when we have our Major League Baseball All Star Game, we'll we'll reassess. All right, uh, Councilmember Doggo Ferry. So um, actually, Harold had answered what or what I was about to say with in regards to what our original statement was, was CDC down through the, the county. So I don't think we need to revise any of that. Um, I did have a question though. Um, so I mean, really before we can make any, uh, assess the situation or make any decision, we're going to have to wait until after the 16th. Is that correct? We can't really make a decision tonight. No, we're not, well, no, and we'll be as we get closer, but it looks like we will be in level blue mm -hmm. from now until May 16th. And the plan is at May 16th to go into level clear as they're defining it. Yeah. What we don't know is what masking rules will be in play because okay. those still exist at the state level and the county level for indoor activities. Okay. So even though the state's relaxing, 
the masking order, we know for a fact, is still in play until, I believe, May 2nd. May 2nd, okay. Is that correct? The mas yeah, the masking order is on a different 30-day time frame than the new dial. The new dial is 16th to 15th, and the masking order was April 2nd, so presumably to May 1st or 2nd. All right, well, with, with, with that, it sounds yeah. like thanks for the update. And if we need to take action, we'll do it in a couple of weeks as we learn more. And uh, we'll go from there. Uh, I've got all kinds of things to say, but the reality is we walk into stores and we're all used to masks and we're free to travel where we want and see life's getting better, I think, for all of us. So, uh, um, and in this way, we all get to see each other's beautiful, pretty, shining faces every week. So the um, let's go ahead and uh, go on to uh, special reports and presentations. Anything, Harold? Nothing, right? Well, just real quick, May 16th is also critical because of where they think they'll be with vaccinations. And like next, next week, Lexi will show that to you all. At this point, we have about 53% of the eligible uh, people and both people that are eligible for vaccinations to be, they're vaccinated, 53% of the total, total eligible population. Um, and when we look at 92% um, of the 70 plus are vaccinated, 79% of 60 to 69, and we're seeing that move through. So as they're opening up, we're seeing more. So that's what everybody's focusing on is really that piece. Um, and um, they have a really good presentation to give you that data. Um, we still really are working with our traditionally underserved populations. We're still seeing differences. Um, and hopefully by then we'll have uh, some more information for, for you all. But that's going to be our ask next week is where we're probably going to need some help and assistance on this. And But we'll cover that next week. All right, great. Thanks, Harold. All right, let's go on to first call public invited to be heard. So what I'd like to do, we'll take a three minute break. But when we come back, okay, keep the list open for the first call that will allow us to do a three minute break and allow people six minutes to get in line. And then after that, cut it off and then we'll we'll have our list. Is that okay, Council Member Dale Faring? That is fine, as long as the public has time to call in. That's That'll all give us six, <laughs> six minutes. It's a win-win. All right. So I'm charging it. Okay, no, just right. kidding. <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. But it, we'll, we'll take at least a three minute break and we'll be back in three to start public invited, uh, first call public invited beer. All right, bye. Okay, folks, you should see on the screen now the number to call in for public invited to be heard. That number is 1-888-788-0099. When prompted, you will enter the meeting ID 852 Press pound when it asks you for a participant ID. When you are let into the meeting and you can hear through your telephone, my instructions, our instructions, please make sure that you mute the live stream. The live stream is delayed a few seconds. Hey, Susan and council that's on. Um, I'm having some wonky bandit with it, bandwidth issues right now. Okay. I may have to keep my video off and then only come in when I need to, to to make sure I can hear, but I'll try to figure out what's going on. If you need to leave the meeting, now would be a good time to try and do that. It's, it's not this. It's, oh. I think it's my router. Okay. Very good. Susan, I'm going to try coming in on my computer. So I'm going to log out on my iPad, if that's all right. Um, stay on your iPad until you log in on the other device. That would be your, your safety. Okay. We'll do. All right. Thanks. thanks.
Is, hey Susan, while we're waiting, is it possible to overtax your overtax your router? Occasionally, Susan. I have to unplug the next light and the router, and then start the next light modem, and then start my router again. So yes, you're you're. Well, if you haven't done that in a while, you may want to do that. But tonight's probably not it. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying, if you, oh, I mean, I've got kids that have been in school. Why, you know. Just think and of that wear out a router more quickly. Yes, devices okay. do not last. I don't know how old your router is, but if it's more than three years, you have the potential of it just dying on you. So, a little like two and a half. Yep. Okay. Um, you may want to look into QoS settings, quality of service and uh, assign it to a to you or your device so that you have more bandwidth you the system gives you more bandwidth over the other occupants in your house that's yeah. another option okay all right that's almost 4 minutes Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, we had the wrong sign up. I hope that hasn't confused anybody. We had the sign up that says not call, not time to call in. All right, we'll take more oh. time if we have to. The, thanks. That was not very good on my part, was it? Let's take another three minutes. Sound good? Let's load her in the queue. All right. Back in three, guys. I think my mouse must have uh, stepped me back in my slide deck. <laughs> I think we're good now. We do have two callers, Mayor, and um, we are waiting for. Actually, let's do. Let's let's actually come back. Can everybody come back? Why don't we just go ahead and take these two callers, leave it up for the next, leave the list, leave the leave it open for the next. Actually. Um, actually, let, let, no, let's take the three minutes because they're going to need to call the number, right? Well, the number was on the other slide. Um, okay. So all the information is still the same. It just, all right, well, let's, let's, just, just leave it. Let's just, let, just, let's just leave it open then for, let's, let's go ahead with public invited to be heard once. We'll stay here. We'll wait till Aaron and Marsh are back. We'll do okay. the, we'll do the first, we'll, we'll just leave it open for the first call and let's, uh, let's go for it. All right, I'll leave the screen up while I unmute the first caller. So the first caller I'm going to ask to unmute, your phone number ends in 139. 139. Are you there? You should be able to hit, there you go. Can you hear us? Good evening, I can hear you. Great. Go ahead and state your name and address for the record. You may begin. Yes, I am Elizabeth Topping, speaking on my own behalf at 4007 Florentine Drive. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am in favor of the inclusionary housing amendments to the Municipal Code, but my comment today is a call for attention to critical needs type of residents in existing infrastructure, and more specifically, residents of mobile homes and manufactured homes. For today, I'll refer to both as mobile homes. Mobile home parks are the nation's largest source of non-subsidized affordable housing, and they serve a variety of family demographics whose needs are not met in the traditional homeowner market. Mobile home prices are significantly less than single family homes in Colorado, making mobile homes a viable option for low and middle income households. Yet the increasing cost of renting the land under one's mobile home threatens affordability. The city should explicitly protect the viability of mobile home living as a part of the broader affordable housing effort. To begin, the city might analyze whether the municipal code protects or takes for granted critical needs residents in mobile home parks 
given the unique tenant relationship and renting pad sites. The city should engage in community outreach with mobile home stakeholders to understand affordability needs. It could then utilize existing research findings from our close neighbors in the city of Boulder to translate to Longmont's particular needs. This research is public in Boulder's Manufactured Housing Strategy and Action Plan. Finally and separately, the city should increase accessibility to information on rights related to mobile homes with a simple link on the city's website. In amendments last summer to the Mobile Home Park Act, the state has added protections for mobile homeowners, including an express prohibition on retaliation from park owners. The city should help avail its residents to their rights with a link to the Mobile Home Park Oversight Program, where residents may file complaints and enter dispute resolution with violating park owners. In summary, my request tonight is to sustain the viability of living in Longmont's mobile home parks. If the city is to prioritize affordable housing, then existing mobile home parks should not be overlooked. Thank you for inviting me to be heard today. Thank you. Next caller. All right, Mayor, the next caller, your phone number ends in 765. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute. And Mayor, I'm gonna go ahead and lock the meeting so no other callers come in. It's been about mm, another th three minutes here. Caller 765. Are you able to unmute? There you are. Hello? Hi. 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 Thanks. Um, my name is Anne Marie Jensen, and I'm here today on behalf of the East County Housing Opportunity Coalition. And we are a group of affordable housing advocates in the eastern part of Boulder County, including Longmont. We have two Longmont um, members on our board of directors, and we wanted to just make some comments on your inclusionary housing ordinance revisions. First, I want to say that Longmont is doing a lot of really wonderful things with its inclusionary housing ordinance. And having done a lot of research into inclusionary housing, yours is one of the most interesting and creative and thoughtful in terms of trying to balance both for sale and for rent. And also the middle tier program that you have is really unique. And we applaud that and thank you for that. Um, it is kind of hard to get good data on what's going on with your program in terms of how many units are you producing and when they're going to come online. Um, I understand that information is available. It's just not easy to find. So I would ask you to try to create a little bit more transparency about that. So those of us who are trying to follow it could follow it easily. Um, I wanted to also say that uh, in your conversation when you last reviewed the ordinance, you made the decision to do a five-year limit on um, charging back when a developer um, converts a for rent unit to a for sale unit. And we don't think that's probably enough time um, to create the disincentive that you want you know, to get the, keep the developers from paying the lower rate. And I know you considered 10 years, and we think 10 years is probably better, and I would ask you to reconsider that item. Um, we appreciate um, the changes in the deed-restricted housing that protects homeowners from possible crashes. Um, and we thank you for changing your AMI to 50% of AMI on the credit that developers can get for um, the voluntary agreements. And then lastly, I, I know you're not voting on it tonight, but you meant your last um, council, you looked at um, items number 10 and 11. Uh, 10 was the update to the sales price formula. Um, we think this does need some additional work. If someone is paying 40 to 50% of their rent in housing because you haven't adequately accounted for the HOA dues or uh, property taxes or insurance, 
that is not the intent of an affordable housing program. Everyone has sort of agreed and HUD has put guidance forward that 33% of an income is what people should pay no more than. So we urge you to support this change in the formula that your staff are suggesting you look into. And um, we think it does need to be changed. Thank you, ma'am. That was over three minutes, but we have to cut you off, but thank you. Point well taken, thank you. All right, was that it for our callers? Yes, Mayor, that was the last caller. All right, if you could go ahead, uh, Ms. Quintana, and read the consent agenda for us, that would be great. Of course, Mayor, item 9A is ordinance 2021-22. A bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 3 of the Longmont Municipal Code on personnel rules. rules. Public hearing and second reading is scheduled for April 27, 2021. 9B is Ordinance 2021-23, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 1404 of the Longmont Municipal Code on meter and water line maintenance for arterial right-of-way. Public hearing and second reading is scheduled for April 27, 2021. 9C is Ordinance 2021-24, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H50 to Gail Shipper. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 27, 2021. 9D is Ordinance 2021-25, a bill for an ordinance approving the First Amendment to the Vance Brand Municipal Airport Parcel H14-B lease. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 27, 2021. 9E is Ordinance 2021-26, a bill for an ordinance approving the First Amendment to the Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel NH-T2 lease. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 27, 2021. 9F is Resolution 2021-33, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Boulder County Public Health for its Genesis project. 9G is Resolution 2021-34, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving an amendment to the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Boulder County Housing and Human Services for Parent Education Services. 9H is Resolution 2021-35. A resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a Fifth Amendment to the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Boulder County for repair and remediation from flooding. 9I, Resolution 2021-36, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving an amendment to the intergovernmental agreement to, between Boulder County and the City of Longmont for the Environmental Sustainability Matching Grant Program for Sustainability Projects in 2021. 9J, Resolution 2021-37, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Victim Assistance and Law Enforcement Board of the 20th Judicial District for 2021 grant funding for victim services. 9K is Resolution 2021-38, a resolution of the Longmont City Council in support of immigrant families of the City of Longmont to access occupational licenses through Senate Bill 21-077 and benefits through Senate Bill 21-199. 9L is approval letter to the Attorney General regarding allegations that managers in the Colorado Air Pollution Control Division ordered their staff to falsify data and strongly urging an immediate and thorough, thorough investigation into these allegations. Phew. All right, well done. I'd like to pull, um, I'd like to pull L. Anyone else want to pull any? All right, do we have a motion for the, Council Mayor Peck? Thank you, Mayor Badley. Yes, I'd like to pull I. Great, okay. All right, let's go ahead and do we have a motion? Yeah, I'll move that we uh, approve the consent agenda minus L and I. Second. All right, all in favor of the consent agenda, minus L and I, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the uh, consent agenda, minus I and L, pass unanimously. Let's go on to ordinances on second reading and public hearings on any matter. And actually, this, I, I, let's go ahead. Can we, is it possible to address I and L right now? I mean, I mean what I'm saying is, can we put up the, the number on the screen? so that people can call in for the opportunity to speak on the ordinances so we can we don't have to take another break. Is that possible, Don? Mayor, we certainly can. Um, when the screen is up, you you may not see all of council's videos though. Right. Well, let's let's see what happens, but let's let's invite the public to call in if you want to speak at the uh, uh, public hearing on any of the ordinances to be discussed and voted on uh, pertaining to their second reading. Uh, go ahead and call in now, please. Councilmember Rodrigo Faring. Um, yeah, I just wanted to. Um, so I'm following the live meeting on my other laptop, mm -hmm. and I saw that the items that were pulled were I, K, and L. Was that a typo? Did you mean to to add 
K in there? No, it was just I and L. Okay. okay. So I just want to make sure that that gets corrected for the record. All right. I, I, I don't want to discuss it, but I'm, I'm going to move approve. I'm going to move approval of item L. Do I have a second? Second. All right. All, uh, any, uh, all in favor of item L, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. All right. The motion uh, carries six to one. Okay. Um, let's go on to item I. I apologize, Mayor. Who was the nay on that vote? I, I'm sorry. I was. You were. Okay. Thank yep. you. Um, can we go on to item I? Councilmember Peck, please. Mayor Bagley, I, I'm curious as to why you voted against it. I would like that discussion. I'm just... I just, I just don't think we should be telling the state. I think that I, I personally think that this, I, I don't want to have the discussion, meaning that, the, that, that, I mean, we could spend time on it. And the whole point was we waste too much time on state issues, which are important, but this council, I think, has really important work that we could be focused on here locally. That, that's it. So I don't okay. want to waste more time. I just wanted to know well, what you, what you thought. That, that, that was it. Thank I mean, you. I would, I think I think the attorney general should should do that, but I just don't think that we need to weigh in on all the issues that are going on outside of Longmont. That's it. Okay, all right, thank so you. But why don't you go ahead and take the floor, keep the floor, and talk about item I, please, Councilmember Peck. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just have a couple of questions. Um, so this grant is for a, a list of categories. There was a list of categories um, that this funding can be used for. However, when I look at the grant and what it is being used for. It looks like it is either for new hires or for salaries. Can somebody clarify that for me? Yeah, uh, Mayor Bagley and uh, Council Member Peck, Lisa Knobloch, Sustainability Program Manager with Public Works and Natural Resources. So the list of categories that you see there is coming from the ballot language that was included in the sustainability tax where this funding is coming from. And it doesn't explicitly state in that list of categories, staffing or salaries, but it is included in like sustainability planning or if there's staffing support that support any of these specific categories. And the, the funding requests that we have are for a second year of the grant and residential program coordinator that we funded through the sustainability tax last year with it, which is a two year term limited um, position as well as uh, a new similarly two-year term limited position that's an equity and engagement specialist um, that's helping to implement equity in our climate action recommendations as well as a, a project that's not staffing that's focused on the climate risk and vulnerability mapping which is uh, um, part of one of the climate action task force strategies around a, a public health um, plan around the impacts of climate change. Did that answer your question? It question. did. Um, but Lisa, I'm in that list of uh, things that we want to accomplish. I'm curious as to where the funding for some of those things and do you have projects for 2021 that these people are actually going to be working on? Because what I would like to see is something out of this, you know, something that is going to affect our uh, our sustain the sustainability in our city for our clients. But if it's only if it's only grant money to hire people and to get more studies, and that's frustrating for me. So, do you have a list of projects that you're going to be working on for 2021 and a and a timeline for those? Uh, Council Member Peck. Uh, yes, and I'll be coming to you in the coming weeks or so with an update on that list of projects from the Climate Action Task Force and what the status on each of those is. The staffing support that we're requesting through this funding, that the staff capacity is, is one of our limiting factors right now in implementation of those projects. So those staffing requests will specifically help support implementation of some of those projects that have been identified um, such as well, the implementation of the equity recommendations, the equity checklist that the Equitable Climate Action Team, formerly the Just Transition Plan Committee, put together that's using to, that we're using to advise as we get into the implementation of climate action strategies to make sure we're doing those in an equitable way. And the 
project that is listed here, the Climate Risk and Vulnerability Mapping Project, yeah, is specific to one of those climate action recommendations, the, the public health plan. This is a, a data gathering focus that'll help feed into that plan that our um, OEM folks didn't really have the capacity to do in 2021. So we'll be focusing on that portion in 2022, but this is helping to gather data that will inform that project. Okay. So, Thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, that presentation of, of where we're gonna go with this. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so with that, I'm gonna move 2021-36. Second. Second. All right, Councilmember Peck uh, made the motion. Councilmember Christensen uh, seconded it. All in favor of item I of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed, opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, let's go ahead and go on to items on uh, ordinances on second reading. Let's go ahead and just keep keep the keep the line open. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. No, you, you're good. Sorry. Okay, all right, thanks. All right, let's go ahead to item 10A, Ordinance 2021-18, a bill for an ordinance amending chapters 15.05, sections 15.05.220 and 15.10.020 of the Walmart Municipal Code on Inclusionary Housing. Are there any questions from council? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing on Ordinance 2021-18. Is there anybody on the line? Mayor, we have no callers that have called in during that time. Okay, we'll just keep it open. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing then. Um, can we have a motion pertaining to Ordinance 2021-18? Uh, Dr. Waters? Yeah, I'll move approval of Ordinance 2021-18. Second. All right, it was moved by Councilmember Waters, seconded by Councilmember Martin. All in favor say aye. Any dialogue or debate on this? Anybody wanna speak against it? Councilmember Christensen? Um, I do think we need to make some other additions of specifically having to do with um, um, the land donation portion of it, but we can do that um, at another meeting. Thank you. All, right. um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, ordinance 2021-18 passes unanimously. Let's move on to item B or item 10B, which is Ordinance 2021-19, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 4.79 of the Longmont Municipal Code on fee reduction or subsidy. Um, any, uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy Fedler? Sorry uh, to interrupt. So on this particular one, there are a couple additional changes um, that we caught um, today, actually. Sure. Um, they're not substantive, they're um, cleanup items. And it is on um, 4.79.030, um, item A. It's changing. It says currently um, each person or organization may apply for fee reduction subsidies along with building permit application using the form supplied by the Director of Planning and Development Services. We're changing that to city because Planning and Development Services doesn't provide that form. Um, and then everywhere that it says the Director of Planning and Development Services Department, we're changing to just Director of Planning or Planning Director. And I think that is pretty much all of the changes. So um, that's kind of throughout the rest of the um, that code section. Okay. All right, do we have a motion? So do we need to make a motion as amended by, is that, is that what we need to do? Tim, Hull? Mr. Mayor, I believe you'd have to make a motion to amend and then and then vote on the ordinance right. itself. I'm, I'm going to move that we amend ordinance 2021-19 as explained by Kathy Fedler. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. The amendment uh, the, the motion to amend uh, carries unanimously. And I will move to I will move to pass ordinance 2021-19 as amended. Second. Second. All right, I made the motion. Dr. Waters seconded it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Let's move on to 10C, Ordinance 2021-20, a bill for an ordinance approving the lease agreement between the city of Longmont, Colorado, and the Oligarchy Irrigation Company. Um, are there, uh, actually, I don't know if I had, uh, time out a second. Was there anybody on the line? No, Mayor, we have no callers. The 
okay, media is still unlocked. All right. I don't know if I opened it for public hearing. I don't there, recall if, that you did. And I, and I don't either, but um, I didn't. And so I will, if anybody was on the line, I would open it for public hearing right now and we'd revote if that was the case, but they're not. So we'll continue. All right, we'll go on to ordinance 2021-20, a bill for an ordinance approving the lease agreement between the city of Longmont, Colorado and the Oligarchy Irrigation Company. Are there any questions from council? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Nobody's on the phone call. So let's go ahead and close it. Do we have a motion for ordinance 2021-20? So moved. I'll second it. All right, uh, seeing no further discussion from council, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, uh, motion carries unanimously. And then uh, finally, for second reading, we have item 10B, ordinance 2021-21, the bill for an ordinance designated at Heil Millinger Silo at 2000 U Creek Drive as a local historic landmark. I know some people are gonna be happy there. All right, um, everybody's pretty much familiar with this issue, I think, but um, seeing no questions or comments from council, let's go ahead and open it to public here. Sorry, council member Christensen. Um, I just wanted to thank the public for bringing this forth. I know you thought I, we weren't listening to you, but we actually were. And um, I'm glad we could work with the, that the neighborhood could um, get a say in what they want to have happen in their neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So let's go ahead. And there's nobody in the, on the call, right? That is correct. Perfect. And we will open and close the public hearing on ordinance 2021-21. Uh, do we have a motion? I'll move ordinance 2021-21. Second. All right, it's been moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Seeing no further discussion or debate, all in favor of ordinance 2021-21, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, we've already dealt with the items removed from the consent agenda. Um, so let's go on to general business. So we've got three items tonight, or four, four three of substance. We've got, so for 12A, we're going to start with the annexation referral, which is we're simply giving staff permission to explore whether or not annexation should occur. We're not actually voting on annexation tonight. So this is pertaining to 10161 Ute Highway. It is a request for city council to refer the, the property located to this address into the annexation review process. Um, do we have a presentation by staff? Mayor Bagley, members of council, Aaron Fostig, um, principal planner. Um, you have information in your communication, in your packet. Um, I do have a staff presentation that I'm happy to go through to give an overview. And I also have the applicant. Um, so I'm happy to do whatever council would prefer. Does, does anyone have any specific questions before we take a motion? Dr. Waters? You know, I don't know. I don't know if these are questions or simply messaging, but I, I looked at the materials. Um, I saw the I saw the letter. Uh, I saw a reference to uh, addressing drainage and detention issues as an extraordinary benefit for the community. Um, I'm I'm not an expert enough on on that or what is or is not an extraordinary benefit to uh, form a judgment. But I but in the concept plan, unless I missed something, all I saw was a map with a and then a description, a general reference to how the types of housing stock without many specifics. So the messaging here for me, I'm, I'm assuming, well, this will get approved or for referral, but I want that whoever the, 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 the applicant, when this comes back for approval, personally, um, I'm gonna wanna see that this, how this helps accomplish our housing objectives. Um, Cause I, I could not make that judgment. If there are extraordinary benefits, I'd wanna see how they're explained beyond what I saw in the application, number two. Number three, we've got we've got two referrals tonight, and um, and I've shared this with staff. I I will remain concerned when we annex properties. And I by the way, I see this quite differently in terms of what we receive for information from the one we're going to address in just a minute um, on the south side of town. But if if we're gonna if we're gonna annex, especially at the edges of town, which is going to contribute to sprawl, I want to be really clear on housing objectives and. I'd like to see a, a, at least a 30 year, if not a 50 year impact analysis of what it's gonna cost the city. The developer is gonna pay for infrastructure for initially, but the city's gonna pay for maintenance and replacement or, or, or rehab over an extended period of time. And I understand housing doesn't always pay its way, 
but I'd like to see some evidence that we've done that kind of economic impact, especially when we're annexing at the edges of town, that, that, it, that it's going to be, it is not going to be a drain on the city over the, over the long run. So when it comes back, I just, the, 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 the applicant got to know those are going to be questions that I'm going to bring to the, to the discussion. Um, Mayor Bagley, Council Member Waters, I maybe should mention this wasn't my presentation, but just for everyone's benefit, um, I think it was in the communication, but I do want to mention that this property is north of Highway 66 in the State Highway 66 um, mixed use area, the formerly the Cherry Lake neighborhood. Um, it is within the Longmont planning area, so it is, it is planned for eventual annexation and development within the city of Longmont. Um, the comprehensive plan does show um, a mix of land uses that are really articulated more in that framework master plan. And that's what the applicant's concept plan is based on. So we would at this point expect to see that more general information and we can see um, at the time of annexation if the applicant is prepared um, to provide that level of detail, but often we don't see that until later phases in the development process. So we can certainly um, have them, if you do refer this, have them include even some more narrative in their um, application materials. I also want to mention that um, there is some additional infrastructure that would be required, obviously, as this area develops, and there's some planned collectors um, shown on the comp plan that this applicant would um, be responsible for a portion of. So if, if you want more information on any of those items tonight, we can provide them, but certainly I think the applicant heard your messaging of, of what you would be looking for at the time of annexation, if referred. You're Mr. muted. Waters, you're muted. Can I make one more comment, and then I'll be quiet. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I, I saw the I saw the narrative already about housing stock. Um, nowhere in our objectives do I see housing stock that addresses or that 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 asks for executive high end housing. Uh, we're pretty clear on the need for mid tier working class homes, and and uh, an obligation on our affordable housing agenda or objective. So. Um, just to be, just to refine the message in terms of what, what you might be following up with. I'm done. Councilmember Christensen. Um, in the nearly eight years I've been on council, I think this is the third time this property has come back. And like the mayor said, with the, um, the sugar mill, <laughs> we keep, you know, this has always been previously, um, agricultural land. It was perfect for agricultural land because it had a lot of water. But the problem is when we started building houses near it, it causes that there's a lot of flooding. It's got a huge problem with drainage. And it would be good if, you know, potentially if uh, we could resolve this problem uh, working with the developer. However, I just, you know, once again, we're looking at something that uh, I don't want to see it again. <laughs> um, and I, I would hope, as um, as uh, Councilman Waters said, I would hope to see more detail next time around. I understand this is just early and you're just doing bubble charts and things like that. But um, uh, I would like to see, I'm tired of seeing us uh, annex ag good agricultural land, which was purchased cheaper than usual because it was agricultural land and then we annex it in and then it be, then we rezone it and then we give waivers and yeah. So this is a problematic piece of land and I know they know that, but I'm just saying, gonna be difficult, but thanks for trying. <laughs> and I guess in, 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 in Ms. Mo sorry, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I know that, you know, I might have a, a different outlook on this, but I've, I've said for a long time, ever since I've been elected to council, that I am generally pro-annexation because that puts it in our jurisdiction. If it's not annexed, it's in somebody else's jurisdiction and they can decide what they feel is appropriate there versus what the city of Longmont decides is appropriate there. Um, and I will just make one example in the sense that tonight, we have a uh, appeal of a planning and zoning commission decision and completely different in concept, but at the same time, it still puts that in our jurisdiction. 
Whereas if this was, say, Boulder County's land, we would have no uh, no dog in the fight if you were. Um, so I'm always pro annexation to bring things into our jurisdiction to make those decisions as we see fit as a city council, um, as the elected representatives uh, of Longmont. Whereas if it's not in our jurisdiction, then Boulder County can do it. It's the same kind of argument that we had about the compost facility, for instance, in the sense that we wanted more say about the compost facility, but we don't technically have it because we're not Boulder County. Mm -hmm. And so I think these, you could say that if, <laughs> uh, it'd be hyperbole, and I'm going to say it because just to make the point is that Boulder County could technically stick a compost facility in Terry Lake. We don't have control of that at this moment. I, I don't think they will. And I, I guarantee you they probably will not. Uh, but at the same time, we don't have control of that property. And so I always like to refer things to annexation with the understanding that we will then have further uh, oversight over what gets developed or not developed in that particular piece of land. I don't think that necessarily equates to urban sprawl because we also have uh, you know, a footprint that's set out for us by Dr. Cog, I, I believe, uh, the, the, the metro region. And so I don't, I don't particularly fear urban sprawl as a result of this uh, because, I mean, any of us have, have driven in multiple directions from Longmont and there's, there's plenty of agricultural land that has been protected by conservation easements as well as open space uh, purchases. So I'm not worried about open spot so much as I am about what gets developed in either adjacent to us or within our, our footprint. And so I'm always a proponent of taking control of that footprint as much as possible. And so I will agree with this uh, annexation, but uh, I will also say that what, end up, what ends up uh, being proposed by the developer will be of great consideration to how we go forward this. Councilor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I agree with uh, the comments that have been made, but it's always amazing to me that people, that developers or whoever buys land that cannot be developed the way they want it to be, and then come to the city and, and say, this is what we want. We know that it has all these problems, et cetera. Can you make it work for us? Um, it, I find that very interesting concept instead of buying the land and using it for what it, it can actually support. So I will vote for this. I agree with uh, the Mayor Pro Tem completely that we need to have these, under, these annexation parcels that need to be annexed within our control. Councilor Martin. Yeah, I just like to say that I, I think we do make progress in every branch of engineering. And just because it's been turned down before is not a, a reason why we can't see a solution brought forward by the developer um, in such a way that it's accessible the next time. So I will also vote to refer. And I'm gonna vote on this too, Lauren, but I just wanted to let you know that, so if it's the land, I mean, I, I seem to recall talking to a previous owner and it was going to be eight to $9 million to fix the drainage issues. And so I, I'm going to vote for this too, but I don't want you guys to waste money and time. I would not vote for it. I've said this to previous owners. If the developer is expecting or hoping that the city somehow contribute cash to this project with, without explaining what the reason would be. Um, so just, just, uh, just I just putting that on the table that it's not again I said it not only for council but for you and your your clients that uh, this is only council's blessing to explore annexation it is not approval of the plan so listen to staff and don't waste money or time please I, I guess that's my just friendly advice all right so uh, I will actually move 12a uh, the annexation referral of 10 161 U highway second, second. All right, I made the motion and it was seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez and everybody it sounded like, but we'll go with you, Aaron. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the annexation referral is approved unanimously. So congratulations, Lauren, or maybe not. We'll see. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, let's go on to 12B. It's also an annexation referral, same process. Somerset Village, Kanemoto Estates, a request for the City Council to review the Somerset Village, Kanemoto Estates property into the annexation review process. And I'm assuming all our comments still hold true for this one, right? Okay. Councilmember Christensen? Um, I won't be voting to approve this, although it looks, I mean, there's a fabulous um, uh, brochure uh, or presentation. It makes me want to move out there right away. However, this is um, land that has always been agricultural. It is currently being farmed. It is also uh, open space land. It is also um, has a conservation easement on it. And we're being asked to overturn all of those and annex it. And uh, I can't vote for that. Sorry. Councilmember Waters. Yeah, I am going to vote for this. Um, uh, I, as I read, the the developer is going to have to deal with the with Boulder County and and whatever it's going to cost to buy out of the conservation e easement. That's explicit. Uh, but I wish every every annexation application brought this kind of detail, number one, and this kind of commitment to the housing stock, to the mixed use, to, to a child care center that's designed into this. If we want to grow that capacity, this, for me, this, is, this epitomizes what could be considered extraordinary benefits to a community, um, to this community, through an annexation. And, and as the concept plan gets advanced and we had a chance to to approve or PNZ approve a development. So I'm, I'm not, a, to make the point I was trying to make earlier, if I'm annexing at the edges of town, I think has implications um, and, and more implications for long-term cost. But when when the value or the, the benefit to the community is, is what we will see reflected in this proposal, it's an easy vote for me to refer it forward. All right, uh, Councilman Martin. Yeah, um, I've been waiting for this development to come back in the form that it has has come back. It is a positive contribution to the vision that we have for a sustainable city, and um, it it supports other things that we have um, through Advanced Longmont 2.0. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I think it's a positive con conversation, contribution, and even an extraordinary one if the concept that has been described is fulfilled. All right, so I'm going to actually move uh, annexation, uh, approval of the annexation referral of Somerset Village. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Now, before we vote on it, um, is there anyone else? So, Councilor Christensen, hold on one second. And has anyone else who has not spoken would they like to speak against the motion? I know Councilmember Christensen did. Okay, Councilmember Christensen, do you have another comment before we vote? Yeah, I'm sure this will pass, and I do think it looks like a lovely uh, thing. And it has, uh, as uh, Councilman Waters said, uh, they have a great detail, and uh, everything looks just terrific. But when someone puts a conservation easement on their land, they do that in the good faith that it will stay in perpetuity. And I don't think we should take lightly just getting rid of it so that we can, you know, create a development that spreads things out and is in contradiction to our uh, alleged commitment to um, supporting agriculture in, the, uh, in our comp plan. All right, so there's a motion on the table to approve the annexation referral. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. All right, it has been uh, passed uh, six to one with Councilmember Christensen in the dissent. Um, all right, let's go ahead and go on to 12C. Um, let's take a five minute or three to five minute break as we let staff and our uh, uh, the appellees and the appellors and all those people get ready. So we'll be back and let's shoot for three, but we might bleed over a little bit. And then uh, uh, Harold if uh, or Don, if you could make sure that uh, we announce how much time we have so I can keep track and keep everybody, um, keep it all fair and keep it on lockdown, that'd be great.
So we'll see you in three. Okay, guys. All right, let's start coming back. Just hang tight for Aaron and Polly. And while, while we're waiting, um, Don, what is the time limits? Do you want to run those by us again? Mayor, I would ask Ava to come on and give us those if you don't mind. I was looking at the council comment. I don't see those there. So I just saw Ava. Hey, Ava. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, Council Members, Ava Prehajewski, Planning and Development Services. I am looking for that right now. So um, I believe the time limit. So um, staff's going to make the presentation, give you the background. The appellant is going to come on. Um, they have a limit of 35 minutes. 
Uh, and then you would open the public hearing and the limit is two minutes per person on any public uh, discourse that uh, if anyone calls in um, and no more than 60 minutes total, um, according to the script that we typically use. Um, I don't anticipate that we would go that long. Um, and then there's a rebuttal um, part after questions um, and the rebuttal uh, is limited to 15 minutes. All right, so, I, so 60 minutes total for this process or yeah. 60 minutes for public hearing? 60 minutes for a public hearing. Okay. Yeah, that's for the more acrimonious ones where you get a lot of uh, people coming to public invited. All right, so the, uh, I would, is it Eugene? Can I ask you a quick question? Fire so, away, Mayor. All right, so my question is, just, so just, so as we, as we get going here, we're going to have a, so at the end of that 35 minute period and at the end of the public hearing in law, um, when we're, we're having a trial before we offer a defense, you know, it's possible just to say, look, your honor, have they proved, have they met their burden and we can go ahead and have a vote or the, 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 the judge can say, no, they didn't. The defense does not even need to put on a defense. We're done. Is it possible to have such a conversation after that? Meaning, is it possible if they if they do not convince us? Do we if they if, if they do not convince us? Do we need to have the rebuttal? This is a procedure. I, I mean, I have no, no. idea what's going to happen. No, I don't think you do. We have to have the rebuttal. No, I don't think you do. Okay, I good. Think they can present their case in chief. If you do have the rebuttal, you need to give both sides the opportunity. Correct. So what? So what I would like to do is uh, before we have the rebuttal, um, uh, if there's somebody who, anyway, I just want to have a discussion prior to the rebuttal. And if we don't need the rebuttal, we won't have the rebuttal. But if we need the rebuttal, we will have the rebuttal. Does that make sense? I, I would make that clear at the beginning of the hearing so that all parties and the and, public and that is the, that that hear. is. The contemplated process. Correct. Are we not back? Are we not on? Are we not live right now? I don't know. I th yeah, we are. So I'm making that clear. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm making that clear. I just don't want to. Uh, if if they don't meet their burden and they don't persuade us, then I'd, I'd rather you know. I'd, I'd I mean, no need to to have a rebuttal if it's not needed. But anyway, so let's go ahead and start with the appeal to Planning and Zoning Commission decision regarding Southmore Retail Plaza conditional use site plan and variances from landscaping and building design standards. We've got two options tonight. Um, I guess we have three, but we have two presented in our packet. Um, we have A, a resolution basically upholding the Planning and Zoning Commission. And we also have a resolution saying that we are going to overturn it. I imagine there would be a third option, which is some type of hybrid, uh, uh, who knows what, but we'll see what happens uh, during the hearing. And so uh, let's go ahead and turn the time over to staff uh, with the presentation, and then we'll go in and give the appellant an opportunity to take uh, up to 35 minutes to present their case, and then we'll have the, the public hearing, and we'll go to that point in today's regularly scheduled program. All right, so staff, Ava, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley and council members. Uh, we're going to pull up the slideshow here. Uh, again, this is the appeal uh, of the Southmore Retail Plaza, uh, conditional use site plan and variances. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to give you some background on this, uh, and the applicant will discuss further um, their point of view. I'm just here to give you the background on it. So again, this is an appeal of a Planning and Zoning Commission decision that was back in February of this year. Um, and I'm going to go into more detail about what this application is, but in general, uh, they sought an approval of a conditional use site plan uh, for a 15,000 square foot commercial building. Uh, and they had to, conditional use means that you have to get approval from Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, with that request, they also requested two variances. The first one, they asked to plant less than the required number of trees per code, and I'll get into that in the next couple of slides. And the second request was to provide less than the required windows on the south side. Um, the north side facing Ken Pratt Boulevard was fine. Uh, it's, it's on the other side of the building. So um, we had a public hearing. Um, the commission approved the conditional use site plan, but they denied both variances. Uh, all of this and the minutes are in your packet. 
Uh, in the resolution, um, they stated that the reason they were denying the variances is that, is that they were self-created hardships. Next slide, please. So again, I'm just gonna give you a brief orientation on the background of this project. So I don't have a pointer, but um, there's the red box there. And if you know this property, if you've lived here long enough, you know it's very unique because there's a ranch house in the middle of a very busy commercial area uh, on Ken Pratt Boulevard. Uh, there's the Southmore Plaza uh, at the corner, at the Southwest corner of uh, Ken Pratt Boulevard and Main Street. And this would be just immediately west of it. Um, and then there's like a, there's a 7-Eleven there at Ken Pratt and Pratt Parkway. And this would be just immediately east of that. Um, and so the site for development is uh, just short of two acres. The zoning is mixed use uh, commercial. <laughs> and um, the, there's an, again, there's just an existing ranch house. I'm sure y'all familiar with it. Um, it's current configuration it looks like a square, a rectangle in this picture, but it's actually three lots. And I'll get into that in the next slide. Next slide, please. And so their proposal that they took to the planning commission uh, was two things. Uh, one was to, again, develop the property with a one story, 15,000 and some change square foot commercial building. You see it right here. Uh, thank you, Susan. <laughs> And uh, so what drove the conditional use? Now, normally this would be a use by right and they would do a site plan review with uh, the city's development review team and, and it would uh, move through the process. But what drove the conditional use is that um, on the right side of the building, which would be the east side of the building, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, so they were proposing a drive-through uh, type of coffee shop there. And so um, that's a conditional use under that zoning. So uh, they had to get approval from Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, just some other factoids about this. The, the remainder of the tenant spaces were planned to be some retail and a couple of sit down restaurants. Uh, they had 81 parking spaces. As you can see, it kind of goes all around the perimeter. Um, and the project met all of the development standards except for, uh, I don't know why it says former code. I'm sorry about that. It's the current code, uh, except uh, two things. Uh, one was um, the building design standards in our code say, and I'm going to get into that in the next couple slides, but uh, essentially uh, the, the south side, which is the bottom right there. Thank you, Susan. Um, that is um, planned to be Grand Avenue. It's not built out like that. Grand Avenue, actually, if you're coming in from Pratt Parkway, it dead ends right into this property. So if you were to go there right now, you'll see nothing but vacant land. Thank you. Yes, Susan. <laughs> and so um, on that facade or that side, they were supposed to have a certain percentage of windows. Um, and then the other variance, again, was to plant a little bit less trees than required in the landscape buffers uh, and within the right of way. Next slide, please. Um, so that first variance that we were talking about um, comes from our design standards in the code. Um, there were a couple areas. Um, the code says that when you have a building facade that faces onto a public street, and for them, even though it doesn't appear so, as you saw from the aerial, Grand Avenue is planned as a public street. Uh, they, those must have um, uh, arcades, windows, entry areas, awnings, et cetera, on 60% of the horizontal length. And in addition, the ground floor facing a public street must provide 50% windows and doors. So essentially they need to provide a minimum of 50% windows and doors on Grand Avenue, plus maybe another 10% of, of you know, awnings and other dressy features as you can see here. Um, and so if you look here on the right, the building elevations, the one on the top is Ken Pratt Boulevard. Uh, it meets all of our code standards. Uh, the one on the bottom is the one on Grand Avenue that faces the south. Um, and they're proposing 8%. Um, and the basis for their uh, variance request is they said, you know, the front facing Kim Pratt is where, you know, that's where the public's invited. The backside off of Grand uh, is more for deliveries. Um, the way we do floor planning for uh, commercial buildings, they say that would be the delivery room, the bathroom, the stock room, the kitchen area for the restaurant, and therefore, uh, those types of um, spaces 
uh, aren't really, you know, they're not amenable to having a bunch of big display windows where people are working uh, and, you know, stock rooms. Uh, and so one of the staff recommendations is we, we said, well, maybe um, we can add some awnings uh, to the back of those exit doors for some additional treatment. Next slide, please. And Ava, while you're getting that next slide up, just a quick question on process. What you're explaining now has all been approved. It's not de novo, right? It's not, this is, this is all, this is the eight, everything was approved by planning and zoning that we're hearing right now. That's no, the, so the site plan to have, I guess, the building footprint and everything else there was approved. What was not approved is if you saw on that back slide, the Grand Avenue facade, they're doing 8% uh, transparency, if you will, where they need 50 and, and 60 with awnings. Um, okay, and so, so, so as, you, as you're explaining, can you make it clear what, I mean, because right now we're just approving or unapproving. So if it's, so what you're saying is that, so planning and zoning said they asked for eight, but they declined it. Correct. So, so your role would be to decide whether planning commission made an error in denying that variance and did they have the grounds uh, for approving it, what they're requesting. Got it. And so who, who is appealing? The appellant is the developer? Correct. And they'll come on next and, and discuss further. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just trying to go just, through the background. That's all right. Keep going. Sorry. I just wanted to be clear. It's sure. Not, it was for me. I just wanted to understand. Sure. No problem. Uh, and then that second variance request, uh, again, uh, we require landscape buffers along street facades. So in this case, uh, at the top is Camp Pratt Boulevard. We require a buffer up there. And then at the bottom, because Grand Avenue will be a street, uh, they have to provide the buffer there. And so they've got it, you know, they've got the buffers. That's not a problem. Um, but the code then has very specific amounts of trees and shrubs that you have to stick in each buffer. And so on the Ken Pratt frontage at the top, they would have been required to have 10 trees, um, but they can only provide six. And, and I'll get to that next, because uh, there's it's the same reason for all of it. At the bottom, uh, the Grand Avenue frontage, um, they're supposed to have 10 trees. They could only get two in there. In the, in the new right-of-way tree lawn area, uh, they should have seven trees. They weren't able to get any in. Um, and then this water quality perimeter, it's actually, not to be confusing, but it's inside the landscape buffers. Uh, and so the code would have said you need 14 trees, which could have overlapped with that buffer on that side, uh, but they only provided seven. And so the applicant's justification for all of these variances is they said, look, in, in every, on, on Ken Pratt and on Grand Avenue, we have a utility constraint and um, Longmont Power and City of Longmont Public Works and um, the planning department's landscaping consultant have all said, you can't put trees there because the roots will conflict with our utilities. So, um, they had to be creative in planting their trees and they couldn't get that full number because of these utility constraints. Um, similarly, um, on Grand Avenue in the right of way, um, the city, uh, th there wasn't enough width of right of way. And so there wasn't enough room uh, to facilitate tree planting. And um, the way the applicant tried to mitigate that loss of trees is um, so again, there's a prescribed number of shrubbery. And so whatever that number of shrubbery was, the applicant tripled that amount in their plan. So if there were supposed to be 10 shrubs, they provided 30 in each case uh, to try and mitigate that down. So that uh, the neighbors to the south and the north, they can still get that landscape buffer. It just won't be all trees as much. Next slide, please. Uh, so in summation, um, so they had the public hearing in February, um, the council voted five to two. Again, they're approving that conditionally use site plan. They just denied both of those variance requests on the Grand Avenue uh, frontage of the architecture and the trees. Um, in their resolution, PZR 211B, which was in your packet, um, the basis for that denial states the variance requests do not meet the review criteria for approval in that they are self-imposed hardships. It did not go on to elaborate, um, but you do have the minutes in your packet. 
Um, so the site plan itself was approved with two conditions, um, and one of which was staff's suggestion that they add awnings over the exit doors on the Grand Avenue side uh, to sort of provide a little bit more um, you know, detail on that facade to kind of bump up their percentage from 8% to something more. Uh, and that the applicant uh, complete any outstanding red lines from the development review committee. Um, when we did the site plan review, there were just a few loose end uh, engineering comments. Um, and so they just, that's a typical boilerplate condition uh, when we take a site plan up um, that hasn't been uh, fully approved by our staff team. Um, so again, the minutes are in your packet. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is turn it over to Tom Davis from PWN Architects, and he's representing the applicant. And with him is Scott Ohm of Grounded by Design, and he can talk about your new landscaping questions and the constraints. Dana Buse is here. Uh, he's representative for Tebow Properties. And lastly, I just want to let you know that Chris Huffer from Public Works Engineering is here from our team. Uh, to answer any of um, staff's questions uh, about the engineering and the utilities related to this. So I'll turn it over to Tom. And before we, and so Tom, um, I'm gonna click the, I'm gonna start your 35 minutes as soon as I point to you, but Councilmember Martin, do you have a question or comment quick? Yes, I do. I think this question is for Ava. Um, uh, I live near Harvest Junction and uh, they don't, have that transparency on the backs of their buildings and there is a road that goes behind there. Could you please explain the difference, especially since there was a lot of discussion in the PNZ minutes about that section of Grand not going through ever. And so I, I don't understand why, um, why this requirement sticks. Sure. Um, so when Harvest Junction was developed, that was probably 15, 18 years ago, maybe more. Um, we now have our new, our new and improved uh, zoning code that was enacted in 2018. So we have new and different and sometimes stricter uh, design standards than what we had in the old code. So that was not a requirement when Harvest Junction was developed. It is now uh, a requirement under the current zoning code. Uh, and just for clarity, um, it, mm, I don't think we ever said that Grand Avenue is never going through. What we said was it's going to stub out to the end of this property. And when the city's uh, public works department can get the right of way from the property ownership on east of that, uh, they will continue to work through uh, getting Grand Avenue moved all the way to Main Street. All right. All right, with that, uh, Tom Davis. You're on the clock. Go for it. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, well, let me just uh, preface. Uh, first, let me uh, say thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council for your time tonight. Uh, preface this presentation that the project team believes that these are very uh, simple, reasonable, and unavoidable asks. Uh, that's why we're having an appeal. Uh, and also that we've been working with uh, engineering and planning for 15 or 16 months to try and uh, develop the best possible project for the city and, and for everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, so with that, we'll get started. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so our request uh, for city council is to approve uh, planning staff's 217-21 recommendation. Uh, in their staff report for the planning and zoning meeting, they stated conditional approval of requested variances due to hardships for existing site conditions because applicant meets the variance request criteria for approval. Uh, so we're quoting that out of uh, Ava and her group's recommendation. Next slide, please. Uh, so let's take these one at a time. Uh, first is the inability to meet the, the landscape requirements as uh, Ava described, and that uh, as to try and make up for the inability uh, of the existing utility site conditions uh, the applicant proposes us uh, 60 additional shrubs as kind of a substitute for what we could do because of uh, the, the existing condition restrictions that we were uh, up against. Next slide, please. Okay, so a landscape buffer is a 20-foot buffer from the property line. Okay, so that's nothing 
this is where we're having a real struggle with a self-imposed hardship because uh, that's just the given condition uh, of the code, 20 feet from the property line. So what we're showing <clears throat> in this slide is, first of all, number one, there's existing tree screen that's in the right of way on Ken Pratt Boulevard, which is kind of the intent that we're not able to meet, but we feel obligated to point that out, that we're kind of being met, um, uh, that there's a condition, a contextual condition of a tree screen that is between our site and Canberra Boulevard. Um, and then the, the two white horizontal areas at, at the north, um, there are util utility easements preventing uh, tree planting. And um, on the south side on Grand, which doesn't exist today, and we're gonna get into this, but the, um, the land dedication, the payment for the extension of Grand is, is by uh, our project team is that they're power lines. So um, we're gonna show some other slides on Grand why there's no trees because there's power lines there. It's, um, hopefully that's easy to understand. And we'll, we'll try and illustrate that with slides. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's a, a little bit of what's going on today. And really the, the prominent element uh, on Grand Avenue right now are power lines. And you can, you can see that there, there's many of them and uh, there shouldn't be trees around them for a safety standpoint. And um, that's why we can't get the trees in this area. Uh, even you can see in photo two at the bottom where you know there are trees and it's kind of probably a, a safety concern for those power lines. Um, so I think the simple argument here is that there are power lines that are gonna stay. We can't plant trees around them because there are power lines there. Um, so hopefully that's you know understandable enough. I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, in a different way. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is what I was mentioning before. Um, <clears throat> if you look and plan up top in the right of way, there's a nice uh, landscape buffer that's in the right of way with a uh, sidewalk and a tree screen. It's not on our site, it's adjacent to our site, but it's kind of filling the bill of, of the intent of the landscape buffer with the trees to create a tree screen to the arterial street. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're on the north part of the site by Ken Pratt Boulevard. You can see uh, the right of way green space I was just describing. Um, <clears throat> so here's where we're bound by the utility easements as Ava was alluding to where we cannot um, plant trees because of the rules of utilities and water quality. Uh, so red is a water easement, uh, yellow is a gas easement, and green is a sand filter. Um, we, uh, as I said, in teamwork with engineering, we asked them about uh, underwater detention, water quality as an option that was denied. They wanted on the surface. So we, this was pretty much mandated. Uh, we tried to negotiate and we were told this is the way that the water quality should be designed. So we did. So you can see the leftover areas is the area we did get the trees we could get in. Um, but again, we find it hard to understand that's a self-imposed hardship because we're not allowed to plant trees there um, from a standpoint of their utility easements. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just in conclusion for uh, uh, variance request number one that it's reasonable. Uh, Longmont planning staff believe the applicant met the criteria for variance requests and stated so in their staff report. Um, which you, you all have, and, and uh, that's their conclusion at the end. They recommended uh, approval of the variance because of the existing site conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is variance request number two, uh, and uh, hopefully you're starting uh, to understand from Ava's uh, explanation. Hopefully we can add to that. Um, in 2018, there's a new part of the code that says there's a transparency, which means windows and doors uh, to face a major street. And you know, we believe the intent of that was so that if you were on, uh, you know, typically there's one major street condition and that, that's really emphasized and welcoming and, and transparent and open and communi communicating to the community. Um, but what we have is a unique condition where we have two fronts and we have a building type that just can have one front. Um, so that's why we're uh, asking for consideration of, of an exception. And then the other part of this is that the Grand Avenue uh, doesn't exist today and we wouldn't need to meet that requirement except for our client is being asked at their own expense and dedication of the land to extend Grand Avenue uh, behind our site. 
Uh, so it somehow seems a little bit ironic that um, we're being asked to provide the street and then um, being held to a standard which the building can't really be developed by uh, functionally. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a graphic straight out of the land development code. So hopefully it helps uh, illustrate the issue that A, um, that the transparency is defined by the windows and doors and there should be over 50% on a major arterial. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that wasn't brought up yet, but uh, as part of the land development code for the drive through is um, we're required to put a six foot opaque fence, which uh, we also see the trash enclosure, which essentially is a similar thing. So uh, maybe counterintuitive to transparency because, you know, seated in a car, even if it's there, over 50% of the rear elevation is, is uh, screened on purpose because there is a car queue there. Um, so we felt like that was a compelling argument uh, against transparency because, um, you know, it's, it's not really visible. Uh, you could say, you know, you can see over six feet and, you know, this and that, but, you know, seated in a car or walking, you're probably not going to see the back of the building from Grand Avenue due to this uh, screening condition that's required by the code for the drive through Next slide, please. Uh, this is just an elevation uh, of the rear uh, facade to show how that uh, opaque trash enclosure and op opaque six-foot screen uh, impact the rear elevation in terms of uh, you know, it's transparency. We've also discovered through this process that we calculated the transparency wrong. Um, the 8% is just the windows and, and the intent was to try and meet some of the intent of the code by getting some transparency back there. And I think it is effective in terms of creating a front presence, but the way it's actually calculated is even with those opaque doors. So we're actually at 19%, still not near 50, but better than eight. Uh, so we, that was our own error in calculating that I wanted to point out. Um, uh, also, just that, you know, as part of the functional of the building in the back, there's a water entry room and that's, you know, full of engineering stuff and, and you know, doesn't really want to be seen through transparency. And we've got to put it somewhere I and mean, we can't really put it in the middle of the building, but there's a natural front and back, like there's a shoe that has a, a place where your foot goes in and a sole where, you know, meets the bottom and it's, it's a pretty standard um, solution. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the kind of functionality diagram for uh, retail planning that uh, Ava alluded to. Uh, you know, basic retail planning, um, and again, as maybe one of the council members suggested, 99% of these types of buildings uh, do have opaque backs. Uh, I, I think she mentioned everything except for security. Security is a big issue. The idea of bringing transparency and, and confusion of which way to come in is, is problematic for the, the tenants they want to control through, through one access. Uh, but the, the back of the lease space needs to be secure, receive deliveries, and house storerooms, restrooms, kitchens, and utility rooms, making it you know, problematic and difficult, not impossible, but um, antithetical to this, this building type uh, to have transparency on the back. Next slide, please. And additionally, when we talk to our structural engineer about this, um, this building type, is also designed specifically to have a shear wall, which um, supports you know, lateral loads uh, by having a solid wall. So if you see the blue line on the slide, uh, there's a specific structural approach to this building type to be solid to support the building. To um, punch a lot of openings in it, we have to create uh, steel brace moment frames, which is a lot of steel to uh, interact loads. Again, kind of counterintuitive to uh, how these buildings want to be designed to have them transparent on both sides, uh, also from a structural standpoint. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the other thing is just asking everyone to take in context Grand Avenue, um, that, that we're not gonna be able to save the world here. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the most prevalent aspect of this elevation and the will be are these power lines, which aren't particularly attractive. Um, at the other existing buildings, even though it's a new code and we applaud it and we support it really, but um, <clears throat> the reality is, is this is always going to be kind of a back uh, to Ken Pratt. And um, historically for blocks and blocks, um, we have opaque facades, no landscaping, power poles. And uh, we just think that context should be taken 
into account with what we're trying to do to make it a presentable designed facade and meet the intent of, of addressing Grand Avenue, um, but in, in a way that's, that's realistic to the function of the, the building. Next slide, please. Uh, further down Grand Avenue, again, no landscaping, no transparency. Really, it's, it's a service, um, it's, it's a service uh, road. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just more of the same uh, existing Grand Avenue. Next slide, please. And again, you can see you know, the problems with the trees and, and the prominence of the, um, the power lines really creating the facade for Grand Avenue. Um, so we just thought that context was important in terms of consideration for our variance request. Next slide, please. Uh, and lastly, we'd just like to end on uh, what we believe is, is a strong design value proposition to Grand Avenue and different from the previous four slides that you'd seen. Um, a lot of effort's been made to make this a three-dimensional building with canopies on all sides. There's three distinctive material transitions so that we have different colors and variation and trying to make it look uh, very presentable to Grand Avenue. Unavoidably, we can see we have the, uh, the scuppers and the drainage, which is it's going to be there. Uh, there's contrasting decorative bands. <clears throat> we do have 19% transparency. We have a roof height variation, so we've tried to take some architectural um, interest to this facade and, and care about it. Um, we propose to add the decorative metal canopies per um, the conditional approval that planning uh, proposed. And we think those really help add to um, creating a front elevation without uh, functionally um, hurting what the building wants to do. Uh, that the fact that transparency was added and you know, obviously we'll have to, likely that uh, glass will be filmed. So there'll be some light shared, but uh, from a security standpoint, it wants to be uh, not see-through. Um, the massing has been articulated with protruding volumes. It's just not one elevation like we saw a bunch of those other buildings and, and the care was taken in the design um, the Grand Avenue wasn't forgotten, but it was, it was articulated in a similar way, but in a, a way that functionally supports the building type. And again, we already talked about the, uh, the landscape walls. Next slide, please. Uh, and similarly um, to the first zoning request, uh, the planning staff uh, did recommend for a conditional approval and they thought that uh, the project met the very, um, met the, criteria for variance requests and stated so in their staff report. Next slide, please. So again, our request is for city council to approve the planning staff's recommendation for conditional approval of requested variances due to hardships for existing site conditions because the applicant meets the variance request criteria for approval. Thank you. The chair would like to thank uh, Mr. Davis for leaving us 20 minutes left in your time. So I'm, <laughs> I'm aware of, of how quick and condensed that was. We appreciate it. So I, I would like to hear the rebuttal. Um, so, I mean, if, I'm assuming that, and if, we, if we were to vote, vote one way at this point, um, because it's the, the applicant is the developer, it'd be a little, a little strange. So let's go ahead. Who's going to provide the rebuttal? Is it city staff? Uh, Mayor, Council, uh, we can uh, rebut. Uh, again, this is a unique situation uh, because right. this isn't being appealed by a third party citizen, uh, maybe saying staff made an error or something in that case. Uh, you know, I don't really have anything to rebut. Uh, we do have to open the public hearing. We are obligated right. to do that as well. Right. But, but my point is that there is no private citizen or group saying we don't want this. It's just no one is, I mean, staff is, staff doesn't care, right? Uh, Mayor, I don't, I don't know that we don't, wouldn't say, my, 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 my point, <laughs> wouldn't so say we don't care. <laughs> I guess just to, just to, just to recap what I'm hearing again, not to argue, but just to recap, what I'm hearing is they asked for the variances, they, staff agreed with those variances, planning and zoning said no, and they appealed. And I guess the rebuttal would be planning and zoning, theoretically if they were here to offer rebuttal, right? Right, uh, so, all I can say is uh, that I know that in the discourse of, and again, it's in the minutes, 
Uh, they felt it was a self-imposed hardship. Um, I think the applicant has demonstrated that um, they didn't create the utility easements, they didn't create the overhead power lines, they um, didn't say, we want to build right away on Grand Avenue, they were told by the city to do that. So in all those instances, um, I don't know that the applicant uh, created that. So, so if we, if we, if someone moves, and so I see the hands, we're going to, we're going to, everybody's hands up okay <laughs> so if we so if we move i just want to understand by process right so if we someone moves resolution 2021 39b it's basically saying uh let the developer proceed with the 19 percent transparency the limited tree space is for all the reasons they said right the number two option correct okay just want to make sure we understand so what we're going to do is we're going to go Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, then we're going to go Council Member Peck, then we're going to go Council Member Martin, then we're going to go Council Member Christensen. And then Council Member Hidalgo Faring, and then Dr. Waters, if he wants to say something. And uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Too. I just what? want to, okay, I just want to disclose that I'm the liaison for Planning and Zoning Commission and was also party to the arguments that staff has alluded to, as well as uh, the appellants. Um, in the sense that I was there, I listened to all of it. I may not agree or disagree with it as a decision maker on this point of view. I just want to make sure there's a disclosure there that I was there, unlike my fellow council members who were not necessarily present for the discussion by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I'd be happy to opine on it at the appropriate time, but I just want to make sure that uh, it is known that I was party to all of those arguments in the sense that I was present. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and I don't think it's inappropriate for you to participate and be here. So appreciate that. All right, we're gonna go with Council Member Peck. So Mayor Bagley, this is time when we can make our, our comments about about the presentation, about- Well, you, you can, I, I mean, and I, so when I say uh, a lot of times, I know that council members have gotten frustrated. When I say someone make a motion, so what I'm really saying is, if there's not a motion, all we're doing is sharing our opinion. And, 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 and our opinion doesn't really matter. And we need to have four people that direct staff, or in this case, four people that make a decision in a quasi-judicial capacity saying, proceed forward. So okay. I don't, so I mean, we can either, you can either move resolution 2021-39A, which says, sorry, developer, mm -hmm. um, you can go ahead and uh, build a project, but you got to do it um, but, but the variances are denied and you're going to have to figure out a way to come up with more windows and more trees or number two, resolution 2021-39B, which is we agree with the arguments as presented by staff and yourself. You can proceed with your project with the 19% window space and the limited trees. Do you have a motion okay. to make? I do. Go I'd like it. to move 2021-39A. A resolution. Yeah. Uh, who, did you second that, Councilmember Christensen? All right. So there's a there's a motion on the floor, resolution 2021-39A, and it has been seconded by Councilmember Christensen. All right. So Joan, do you have any other comments to make? I do, and I wanted uh, to explain why I said that. You know, I read everything in the packet, um, and um, there were a couple of comments made. One that uh, one comment that was made was that they think transparency has been a hiccup in the code. And the other thing is about Grand Street. It's not a hiccup in the code. It was put there specifically um, so that we can build differently in this city. Um, the land to the south that is behind your development is open space. I mean, undeveloped land, I don't mean open space. Um, and more than likely that's gonna be residential, more than likely. And in the plan, the comp plans, Grand Street, Grand Avenue is going to go all the way through. Um, they, we just need to get the right of ways. So your development will be there 20, 30 years. We, we don't, uh, no, I shouldn't say we. I like the Envision Longmont plan because it's about equity. If we build behind these buildings that are all commercial, then we are not being equitable to people who have to are going to be buying affordable housing or lower income housing because chances are those will not be million dollar homes. 
um, and it's already got Habitat for Humanity homes behind it. So I understand that the other buildings, the other commercial buildings on Grand don't have this transparency, but that was before the code was changed. So um, I, I don't want to give you the variances on, on that. The other, uh, the other issue was the, um, here, where is this? So the windows, I also read in, the, uh, in all of the discussions that you don't have to put huge, big windows, display windows in the back. That's not what it's about. It, it's about um, people who are living in those homes are not seeing a big commercial building as they're, uh, what they're looking at. So yes, right now, Grand Avenue is not gonna go through, but in 10 years, 15 years, when those residential homes are built, it will go through to 287. So um, those are my two, those are my two uh, issues right now. All right, so it's, uh, we're gonna keep here talk, we're gonna hear from council um, once we're, I, I would just ask that we make our comments, then we're gonna have a public hearing. But when we hear the public hearing, I just don't wanna redo all the comments. Can we agree on that? Okay, then Councilmember Martin. You're muted. Yes. Um, uh, I actually don't know which way I'm going to vote because I have two questions that I need answered in order to determine how I'm going to vote. Um, so first of all, is there anybody from LPM here? I'm going to ask the question anyway, if maybe Dale's here. Um, Although what, I, what I'd like to just as a point of order. So if we allow them, so I would like to ask if it's possible, if we could get staff to answer the questions, that would be great. Because my understanding is if we allow the applicant to say more, we're, I mean, theoretically, there's no rebuttal, but theoretically. I wanted to ask staff. Go nuts. Dale? Okay. Um, staff, uh, I know that we have a long range plan to bury a much greater percentage of our power lines and those power lines look like prime candidates. Um, and that has a lot to do with whether we take, uh, when we take grand through, right? Because I'm thinking that it's gonna be easier to bury those power lines before grand tries to go through than it would be to build them, to bury them after. So, uh, am I correct in that assumption? And do we know uh, when we're going to get to burying those power lines? Council Member Martin, I've got Chris Huffer here on the line from Public Works Engineering. He can take that. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor and uh, Council Member Martin, Chris Huffer, Public Works and Natural Resources. Um, I, I am not an LPC, I'll say that first. Um, and I'm basing my answer here on uh, comments that they made on the, the the plans. Um, from what I understand, uh, the power lines that are back along Grand Avenue right now um, are transmission lines and they're costly to underground and we would need to underground a larger section of it than what is being platted right now uh, with this um, development. So yes, it is intended to be undergrounded in the future. Um, they have reserved the uh, easements on the plat in order to do that and it will be outside of Grand Avenue but it will most likely be going through um, the landscape area that they're showing on their plan right now. Um, but uh, it's also my understanding that we can uh, implement boring uh, type processes uh, to not have to dig all of that up at the time that that goes through. Hey, thank you. And, and my other question, because I really don't like asphalt and I think we need to be pairing that um, how much of, of our city is, is paved down. Um, uh, the, the staff suggested that rather than, than um, adopting item one or item two, that we could split the difference. And I would like to suggest to others that what we should do is, is say, they don't need 81 parking places. Let's put some more trees in the little, in the little parklet areas in some of those parking lots and, and you know, have 75. So if I had a, you know, uh, what, what my 
current preference is, is to vote no on this and suggest that we make them put in some more trees, but leave the rear facade the way it is. All right, Ava, do you want to take a moment? Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor and Council Member Martin. I just wanted to add to that. Um, that is a, that is uh, obviously an option for Council to require them to uh, put trees in their parking lot. What I just wanted to remind uh, Council is that would not uh, remove the variance because the variance, uh, the, the landscape buffer has to be that first 10, 15 feet right off the, the property line. So um, that's where the trees are required to be. So you can ask them to put trees in the parking lot, but um, they would, you know, that it'd be a condition of a variance approval because the trees are required in the landscape buffer, not in the parking area. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it something that we can do or not? It is? Okay. Sure, that can be a condition of approval. All right, Council, All right. you done, Marcia? Sorry. All right, Councilmember Christensen and then Councilmember Dago Ferry. Um, you know, I've gone through several, quite a few of these actually, and um, what frustrates me is that we never actually do have a rebuttal because we have staff present basically for the developer and the, who recommended this to go to planning and zoning. We never invite planning and zoning to um, explain themselves, although we have the notes, and I think they did a very uh, thorough and thoughtful um, conversation and discussion about this. I particularly liked what, uh, and I, I appreciate both the comments of uh, Councilman Martin and uh, Peck, because we have to think about, uh, this is an infill project and we all know that's much more difficult and I appreciate uh, Tebow Properties for doing this and I think it will also enhance their uh, property to the west uh, it will be helpful for them to be able to tie the two of them together. However, um, Tebow property, it's my understanding that they also own the property just to the south and intend to build residential there. So we have to, and, and the intent is for Grand Avenue to go through. So the intent is really to create something that is workable and also safe in terms of if they do build residential to the south, it will be important for Grand to go through for safety purposes because the there is a really nice little neighborhood to the south of that in Southmore and in Poplar Grove. And um, <clears throat> a lot of those houses are habitat. I've worked on a couple of them and people have, you know, built those with their own hands and hammers. And <laughs> we want a neighborhood that's healthy and safe for everybody. We don't want people looking at the back of a warehouse. So it is important to have, I, I understand the, the um, explanation from the architect about uh, the steel continuity and all that, but you know, you're taking a giant building that faces south and you don't want to put any windows in it. We're talking about passive solar and really trying to think about how to make buildings and all of our uses more, not only more equitable so that people aren't facing a warehouse, but also more uh, sustainable. So that even, you know, if you had some passive solar windows higher up, uh, it, would, it would be helpful and it wouldn't be so bleak to look at. And um, so, you know, if that is indeed a warehouse, it will need deliveries on Grand Avenue, which will really heavily impact the people in Southmore Park and the people in that residential area that will be built there pretty soon. Um, so we're, we're, I think this council is trying very hard, like the Planning and Zoning Board, to think about the future and something that is really good for Southmore Park, for Poplar Grove, which is that little uh, part of um, that sticks to the north there, and create something that's really wonderful. And I am sure that Tebow also wants to create something that's wonderful. So I think we can work together, but I, I am not inclined to um, change our code for this. Uh, I do see the problem with the um, trees to the south, but you know, bushes are not the same as trees. They don't provide any habitat for birds. They don't provide any shade for the buildings. So they're, 
um, trees are not the same. Um, I think that's a problem, though, that it would be worth us trying to think about uh, how to fix, how to make it possible for them to put more trees, put the tree, the required number of trees in, um, given that they have to put them maybe too close to uh, overhead lines. That's the only problem I have, but I'm not inclined to overturn planning and zoning. Thank you. All right, let's go with Council Member Diego Faring and then Dr. Waters and then Aaron, I saw your, I saw your hand again. Okay, we'll get him there. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So my question is for Ava around um, the code revision. So you said that the code was changed in 2018. And I just wanna know what the rationale was for those particular areas. Why, why was it needed? Why do you feel like it was needed to, to change? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor and Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Uh, yeah, you know, um, Brian Schumacher worked on the code update, but I think the intent of um, the additional requirements on building design was again, uh, to provide some sort of interest on a street frontage. Uh, and again, um, you know, some of these buildings that are like, we we're talking about Harvest Junction and, and the neighboring properties, you know, in that case, Grand Avenue wasn't really a, a fully built out street. So I don't think it was um, maybe required of those uh, projects. Uh, again, we just wanted some more um, architectural interest uh, facing a public street, something that looks more inviting. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, I do have a comment. So this area is actually, actually so I'm a full-time teacher and the school that I teach at, which is above 94% free reduced lunch. So a lot of our students are come from families in poverty and time and time again, they are dealt the short end of the stick with quality of living, with, with, you know, just how, where they live. Um, you know, so I, I think that, you know, for aesthetics, you know, and meeting the needs of our, our um, people who don't necessarily come in and, and voice, like we heard a lot of people coming in from Erie and Lookout Road who were able to have the time to, co to call in and make a case for their concerns, a lot of our families are working two and three three jobs in order to sustain any kind of quality of living. So I feel like you know our our my responsibility and my you know I I speak for the people of our community who live our residents, and you know I just I and I also have a lot of trace faith and trust in what the planning and zoning commission say so yeah I, this would be one where i would i would side with them because i believe that they are the experts in this in this issue i read through the comments i read through the mi minutes and you know i i'm inclined to lean towards their decision rather than than making a variance and also speaking for the people who don't necessarily come in and call and say hey you know i'm, I'm not good about this and you know then these are my families that i i'm their teacher to the, a lot of these students. So, you know, I, so I also feel like I have a, a moral obligation to, to at least in this sense, to advocate for them. All right, Dr. Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. <clears throat> yeah, this one, this one is a, an interesting uh, appeal um, because what I hear uh, council members saying is that the, the staff analysis and the staff recommendation to planning and zoning uh, was off, right? That the, the staff recommended approval because of uh, what we were expecting from the developer in terms of Grand Avenue, um, uh, because of utility easements. Uh, what I, what, I, in what I read on page 16, I think, of the staff recommendation, the staff did not see a self-imposed hardship, and the staff's recommendation was approval. I could find nothing, and maybe I missed it, because uh, I, I read it. I could not find what the Planning and Zoning Commission members specifically identified or named as the self-imposed hardship, and, and maybe it was the size of the building, or maybe it was the drive through I couldn't find it. I saw the reference to it over and over again without definition. 
So it, I don't know what to do with that other than scratch my head. But I will say this, um, there are both moral obligations and ethical obligations. And um, when I, I, I would, before I came on this council, I was sitting in the gallery when I saw Brian and Aaron make the initial presentations of the code updates. And if I heard one word over and over and over again during those presentations, it was flexibility. One of the reasons, and I, if, if Aaron or Brian, if, if Aaron's still dialed into this, wants to come back in and comment on that, I'm not certain that that's appropriate in the hearing. Um, but, but I raised questions about what's the, what's the vision? What are we really trying to get done with these code updates? And, and there was never a really good response to that, ultimately, when I came on the council. Um, but I do recall how important it was that, that flexibility, giving staff and us flexibility with the new codes was kind of the mantra and, and an objective we were trying to accomplish. Now the staff is making a recommendation, applying th that, that principle of flexibility or that option, and P&Z rejected it, and now I hear the council rejecting it as well, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I do wonder, when I look at the, at the pro I don't know anything about, I saw that the house was built in 1956, I don't know who occupies the house. I don't know. But I look at that land and think, is that the best and highest use of the land as it sits right now? And, and my answer is, I don't think so. Um, and I'm not certain, you know, what's the, what's the imagination that, that somebody ought to bring for what goes on that land? And I understand the property behind is owned by Tebow as well. And I know there's been discussions about the kind of housing that might go there. Guys, she see, seems to be in terms of fairness to say, we expect you to donate the land and, 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 and finish grand. And now when you do that, you got, you got to apply this other standard. It's just a gotcha, it's, it sounds to me like. And I just, I, I understand the, the arguments made by, by other council members and, um, and consideration of sight lines and those kinds of things. Um, but, but, that, but whatever we do with this is not gonna change what they're looking at in the rest of those buildings. And I look at that piece of ground and think, what's a better use? We ought to, we think we have a, a, an imagination for or the imagination for the, or a recommendation for the better use. Maybe we ought to offer that up. But um, gosh, it seems to me, you, you, we do this. People bring forth ideas and then we want it. We do everything we can to catch them so we can say no to what they were proposing. The last thing I would say is this. Um, well, I just let it go at that. So I, I I want to hear more discussion if we're if there's going to be more discussion, um, but I but I'm 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 inclined not to I'm not I'm inclined to support the staff recommendation originally, which would be I guess resolution B here. Right, um, Aaron. I'm before I'm just going to say my two cents before I call on you because I haven't said anything. I'm I'm going to vote against it only because I'm going to vote for resolution B only because uh, the, the 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 window argument. Uh, what I heard was, you know, the design of the building is a bunch of storage space in the back because it's commercial retail or commercial space in general. And putting the only way to do that would be what put storage in the middle of the building. It just doesn't make much sense. The building currently exit the buildings next to it already have, you know, less transparency than 19%. And the, the actual plot itself, it sounds like you can't fit a bunch of trees on unless you actually substitute for shrubbery. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna vote against it. And if there's a motion for resolution 2021-39B, I will vote for that. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Could I just get a reminder from staff? There are three criteria that allows for an applicant to appeal the ruling of Planning and Zoning Commission. Can I get a reminder of that as well? I believe the uh, appealing party is only asking two of those items, not all three, if my understanding and recollection is correct. Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, so the permissible grounds for appeal from a decision by the PNZ is decision not supported by any competent evidence in the record. Decision is plainly inconsistent with review criteria as shown by clear and convincing evidence or three, decision maker exceeded its authority or jurisdiction as contained in the municipal code. As you saw in the materials, the uh, 
appellant is proceeding under basis, I believe, two and three. Repeat those Review again. criteria and exceeded jurisdiction. Re repeat those again in detail, Eugene, please. Sure. Uh, three permissible grounds for appeal. Uh, one, decision of PNZ is not supported by any competent evidence in the record. But they're not arguing that. They're not arguing that. Two, decision is plainly inconsistent with review criteria as shown by clear and convincing evidence, higher standard than preponderance of the evidence. And three, the decision maker exceeded its authority or jurisdiction as contained in the municipal code. Thank you, uh, City Attorney May. Uh, so number one was not being appealed. Uh, number two, I think the code is fairly clear. So I do not feel that uh, the variant or the, the denial of the variance was outside with clear proof uh, that it was outside of the authority of the Planning and Zoning Commission and outside of the code as stated clearly. And I also think that based on um, how our city government is set up, especially considering the authority of the Planning and Zoning Commission, they were not outside of their jurisdiction. This, in my opinion, is a, is a clear case to vote for A, to uphold the Planning and Zoning Commission's authority. Uh, I will state clearly that I don't agree necessarily with what they decided in that meeting. For instance, I think that the landscaping uh, variance that they requested was reasonable and not self-imposed. Um, that's one example, but that is not what we're deciding here today. And as such, I will be voting in favor of upholding the Planning and Zoning Commission's authority, as well as their decision, regardless of the fact that I may disagree with it. Um, I, I, I was just convinced by Mayor Pro Tem. I think he's absolutely right. I would have, I don't want to, but you're, you're right, Mayor Pro Tem. So let's go ahead and open this up to public. Let, uh, I hear, I see Dana raising his hand. I need his restroom. So let's take a, just a break. Let's open it up for uh, the public hearing. So while we're gone, let's get people in the queue. And then Mr. Busa, when we come back, we will, we will let you, it sounds like address maybe some of the concerns that I just heard, you, you, that, that hand was going up. So let's take a three minute break. We'll be back. All right. Thank you.
we all start coming back. All right, Don, do we have anybody in the queue? Mayor, no one has called in. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and open the uh, uh, open the uh, public hearing and we'll close it as soon as the rest of us are here. I guess well, that's all of us, isn't it? All right, so let's go ahead and there's nobody. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing at this time since nobody called in. And uh, does anyone object to me permitting uh, Mr. Busa to have a comment to address some of Mayor Pro Tem's and my own comments? Mr. Busa, do you wanna go ahead and say something? Sure, I appreciate it then. Hopefully, um, I won't bore you by repeating some of the things that were previously said. But I just I wanted to sort of look at this from a, a longevity perspective and that we've actually been working on this project for over 36 months. So when we started, the code was not um, changed um, uh, as it is now. Um, I think... Uh, I think uh, Councilman uh, Waters brought up a good point, and that's when they were talking about uh, the change in the transparency for the second street or the rears of buildings, uh, or however you may define them, it, that the intent was pretty clear, and that is, you know, we don't want to uh, put up an offensive front to other neighbors that may have access to the to the vision of the back of the buildings. And so, look, we're all, we're all good stewards of the community, or we try to be, and, and certainly when you're a large property owner, you want to do your best to uh, be part of the community and contribute as much as possible. And so we took uh, a lot of those changes that came into the code, you know, we had to because it was changed in the code, but <clears throat> we had to redesign the entire building from the way it was previously designed. And so we did our best to take into consideration all of those changes. And, and I think we did a pretty good job. Um, obviously 19% transparency or, or glazing or however it's defined is not 50%. But when you look at the back of the building, uh, it doesn't look like a back of a building. It looks like a pretty decent architectural um, aesthetic uh, facade that anybody should be um, interested in looking at. Um, we talk about the land of the South, uh, the Habitat for Humanity has a development there now, and I would hope the town would be pleased to know that we're talking with them on the vacant lot as well. And so part of working with Habitat is also more concessions and more contributions of land at, at no benefit to us, but to the town and of course, to the development uh, for that. And it's the right thing to do. Um, but my understanding, uh, and Tom can correct me if I'm wrong, but Grand Avenue is private property on our section of the property right now. We had not designed this building to take Grand Avenue into consideration because it was not a street and there was a long time coming for when it was going to be a street. Um, the city really stepped up and said, you know what? 
even if you build the street there, we still can't get the street all the way to 287 because there's other owners that haven't done anything with their portion of the land. And so it can't be a right of way, right? Uh, meaning the, the property between us and uh, 287 on the south side. So um, they, they uh, asked over a long period of time if we would consider donating the land. And of course, we stepped up and did the donation. More importantly, then they asked if we can build the property, build the, the street. So not only are we donating the land, but we're also constructing the, the street for the town at our own cost. Um, for those who were interested in the overhead uh, utilities, we also proposed to underground the utilities for the city, and they refused to let us do that because we were looking again at the long-term uh, planning for the city. So um, what's interesting is that, and I know it's difficult because I've been on planning board uh, uh, councils for years and city board uh, meetings uh, as a member, and I know it's difficult to come in and listen to a 18 to 24 month back and forth between city staff and a developer. How can we help? This is what we need to do. So a lot of time and energy and effort went in and to be able to sit and make a decision in, in 45 minutes um, to take into consideration everything that was, was reviewed and uh, conceded to over 18 months is a difficult thing to do. So, so, um, Mr. so, Mr. Boos, I guess that, so, I mean, just sorry to cut you off, but essentially, though, I mean, if I was on planning and zoning, I would have approved the variances, you know, I, I understand. I think, I think Mayor Pro Tem also would have approved the variances, but, right. but based on the criteria that Eugene May just said, right. right, what I would be interested in hearing is, what is your argument for that? We've got to find it based on one of these two things. And Eugene, sure. you, so I'm going to have Eugene go ahead and say the, the two different criteria and what is the developer's argument that planning and zoning got it wrong. I mean, sure. I mean, again, I am with you. I'm looking for a way to vote for it. Okay. But if this is the legal hook, what is the, what, this is the legal hook. Tell me how to vote with you with this criteria. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Sorry. May. Go ahead. Well, that's all right. No, I, I, I'm just looking for an answer. I'd love yeah. to vote for you you know, or with you. So the two criteria, uh, the PZ's decision is plainly inconsistent with the review criteria as shown by clear and convincing evidence. And what, or was, that the, what was that criteria, Eugene? The review criteria, uh, they're pretty lengthy. Uh, if you want me to, uh, the basis of their review criteria was that uh, for a variance, uh, the variance has uh, cannot be because the applicant uh, did a self-imposed hardship. In essence, they created a project that created the problem. And staff feels that that is not, staff's opinion, that's not true. Correct. Uh, the existing utilities and, and the overhead lines and all of that uh, are requirements of the city. They weren't created by the applicant. That is the hook. Okay. The, okay. That, that's what I was looking for. So at right. least. So, I mean, yeah. So to answer that the second scenario is that the, the, the review criteria was made by the staff and that we, you know, it was certainly not. It was certainly not self-imposed. Can I jump in here? Cause um, as part of our appeal letter, we, we address that and I can read it uh, verbatim just real quick. Uh, so for uh, its belief of Tebow properties that the combination of criteria two and three become the basis of the appeal. Criteria two, in the review criteria response provided by the applicant in the form of a written variance request as required by the city of Longmont, planning staff stated they believe that the variance re request was met. The re met the review criteria for variance and stated so in their planning report. So that's kind of our explanation for number two. And number three was, the applicant believes that the provision for variance requests are provided in the land development code for situations where the requirements cannot be feasibly met. The applicant believes that in the submitted written variance request review criteria responses, evidence was credibly presented why the project was unable to meet the letter of the land development code due to existing site conditions and conflicting site planning requirements by the city and not a self-imposed hardship. 
Okay. And that's in the uh, appeal on page two. All right, and then uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, do you wanna say the last thoughts? Have you been convinced at all before we vote? Um, you, you know, I hope that all of my colleagues here on council, and I, I trust that they did, read through the minutes and the discussion and the debate of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And I think it would become clear to anybody that did read those minutes that it was a tricky piece. It was a tricky piece because um, certain things, like I said, in my opinion, were not self-imposed. There are other things that I could argue are self-imposed um, that becomes an argument amongst whichever deciding body that is, which in tonight's case is not us. We are hearing an appeal. We are not hearing, you know, it's not our turn to necessarily weigh in on specific legislation or policy ideas that are pieces of the code. We are simply hearing a, a quasi-judicial hearing based on an appeal. And as such, I, I don't feel that the Planning and Zoning Commission was out of line or incorrect in their arguments. I just happen to do, disagree with some of them, not even all of them, but some of them. And so my point of view is that I do not have a position to overrule their decision based on any information that was provided tonight. Um, while I may disagree with them, as I said, uh, there are some, I guess, some may argue uh, broad language that would allow you to argue that it's not self-imposed, but you could turn around and say that it is based on, as already stated, highest and best use. Well, I'm sure that the developer did a highest and best use analysis, but did it you know, was that all presented to planning and zoning? Was it all presented to us this evening? Because they've already, you know, have an architectural design that they've paid a lot of money for. And so they're not going to present us an alternative for that because it would make economic sense for them, even though there could be uh, an alternative. Uh, obviously, based on what was presented to us tonight, uh, they asked for a conditional use that was approved, that was that being the drive-through and the uh, extra, I guess, uh, fencing or shielding of sight lines for the drive-through. That these all technically could be argued one way or another as far as self-imposement is concerned. So I, I still just don't feel that there's enough evidence to overturn the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision on this factor. Uh, but you know, I, I'm. One vote of seven. So thank you. Right. So so I, I was going to say there's a we'll let Marsha or Councilmember Martin say something, but we've got a motion currently on the floor, which is resolution 202139A. It was made by Councilmember Peck. It is a resolution of Longmont City Council upholding the decision of the Planning and Zoning Commission approving the Southmore Retail Plaza conditional use site plan and denying the variances from landscaping standards in code section 15.05.040 and building design standards in code section 15.05.120 based on the criteria uh, uh, previously mentioned by, by Eugene May. So, Councilman Martin? I may be in the wrong here. Um... But uh, the way I feel about this, because I do feel like this is, uh, uh, I give a lot of weight to Mayor Pro Tem's argument that uh, this is probably the wrong decision, but we are not empowered to overturn it. Um, the reason that I think it's a wrong decision are two things. Um, one is uh, about Councilmember Hidalgo Faring's argument uh, I actually think that the likely, um, you know, the, the restaurant, the coffee shop, and small retail that would go into this building would uh, do the, have the opposite equity effect, that it's likely to be something that would enrich uh, a low to moderate income neighborhood. And so I don't understand why, um, you know, if, if that had any weight in the decision, I think it would weigh the other in the other direction and say this would be a good thing for the neighborhood behind the installation. Um, and the other thing is, I think that the Planning and Zoning Board was remiss in not providing 
uh, any information about in what way this was uh, a, uh, a self-imposed hardship because I, I, I think that, that they had a duty to, um, you know, a possible future quasi-judicial hearing to explain just exactly what they meant by that. I don't see it. Um, you know, I think we should go on with the vote because there's no more information to be had, but I just wanted to get those out there. Councilmember, Councilmember Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. I, I, I agree. I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem's uh, logic on this and, and the rationale. It's, it's, it is persuasive and compelling. So before we vote, I, I do need to ask, uh, the staff, I think, would disagree with whether or not there's sufficient evidence. Um, uh, I would, I, based on, you know, tonight's presentation, I would vote differently than, than the majority of P&Z on this. But uh, is it fair for me to ask, does the, on uh, number two, the decision plainly is inconsistent with the review criteria as shown by clear evidence. I don't, would the staff be um, appealing or the staff recommendation to planning and zoning must have been that it did comply or was consistent with review criteria and there was evidence to support that. If that's the case, that's the counter, right, uh, to the argument on number two, it'd be, I would appreciate hearing a response from staff. Uh, Mayor and Council Member Waters, um, I think uh, you've read the record. Uh, staff obviously made a recommendation for approval. We felt it met the review criteria, but ultimately um, this is Council's decision based on the record that you're hearing tonight. And so before we vote, I was just going to say one thing. I'm going to actually vote against it because I think that the hook was met. And I, I totally respect what Council Mayor, or what Mayor Pro Tem is saying. I see that, but we can. I mean, we we can we can approve this. Um, there is nobody objecting to it. Me meaning, there's no citizen, there's no group, there's no there's there, there's nobody here. I mean, staff is saying, you know, it was it was they they think it was the wrong decision, um, and uh, the crate. Staff is not saying that. Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem? I would like to just specify if they're actually saying it was the wrong decision or that it met the criteria to request a variance. Correct. That, that, that's what I'm saying. And who approves the variance? The Planning and Zoning Commission. A absolutely. And I, I, all I'm saying is that we're acting as a judge and there's nobody here. No, nobody here is telling us not to, to do anything. So... Oh, uh, oh. One more thing, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, you said there were two, two options. There are actually four options. Go ahead. <laughs> in the sense that we agree with uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision. We disagree and completely throw it out. We modify it or four, we send it back to Planning and Zoning. There are technically four options here. What would you want to do, Mayor Pro Tem? Oh, Lord. Uh, because I mean, we're about ready to vote, and so if we're going to vote, there is a motion on the table. So yeah, let's yes. see how that motion goes. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Do, all right. So let's go ahead, uh, Councilmember Christensen, and then let's let's vote. I would like to point out that no one was allowed to um, oppose this from planning and zoning. I mean, you know, we we had staff essentially supporting this, and we had we didn't hear it any opposing view because we weren't allowing any opposing view. We only heard from the developer's uh, side and from the staff side who sent it to planning and zoning. We didn't but, hear from planning and zoning. That, that's true. That would be, that would be like a, a district court judge showing up and arguing for the appellate court. That, that, that just doesn't happen. But, but let's go ahead and vote. And I know you want to say something, Mr. Busa, but, but unfortunately- Maybe before you vote, one last thing. Unfortunately, we, I mean, we, we already- yeah, go ahead. What the hell? Anyone object? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Busa. You're, you're muted, though. You need to hit your space bar. If there were a, an option, I heard mostly that people would like to see more trees uh, and that they'd be more likely uh, apt to vote for the 19% uh, the um, skin that we put on the back and so forth. And I think we would certainly support that decision because 
as long as the, the, the code allows us to take away a couple of parking spaces and so forth, you know, we, we want as many trees as possible too. There's just no room to put them. So yeah. if we could approve the, 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 the facade in the back because we made more than enough uh, attempt to make it look more than presentable and habitats from humanity also likes it, just want to throw that in, then we would, we would be in favor of that type of vote. That's All right, it. thanks. So right Thank now you. the motion is though for option C1, again, uh, uh, upholding the decision of the Planning and Zoning Commission straight out. So all in favor of resolution 2021-39A, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Aye. Nay. All right. And that, that was an aye from you, right, Council Member Lago Ferring? Okay. So the motion passes. Resolution 2021-39A passes four to three with Council Members Christensen, uh, Idago Ferring, Peck, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, uh, uh, four. So the motion passes. So um, that's it. So thank you very much. And I know that's not what the appellant wanted to hear, but that's how it went. So, all right, let's move on to 2021 legislative bills recommended for city council position. Hello, Mayor Bagley, members of council, Sandy Cedar, assistant city manager. We have three bills for your consideration today. The first one is House Bill 1233 concerning modification to the requirements for claiming income tax credit for the donation of perpetual conservation easements. Um, currently, people who donate conservation easements can have up to a 50% tax credit. This bill would actually increase that up to 90%, which honestly gives people more incentive to be able to donate those conservation easements to the city. Um, so our the staff recommendation is that City Council support Senate Bill 1233. Councilmember Martin, do you want to make a motion? I move supporting it. Second. Second. All right, let's vote. All in favor of supporting this and following uh, staff's recommendation, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Next. Mayor, second bill is House Bill 1238 concerning the modernization of gas energy efficiency programs. Had to read this one a few different times to make sure I understood how the bill actually works but it updates the methods used for cost effectiveness for demand side management when it comes to public utility selling natural gas. Essentially, it uh, currently we don't reflect any of the future benefits of cost avoidance in this demand side management um, formula. And so this bill, if it passed, would actually put that as part of the way that the formula goes. And so it really takes into account um, you know, some of the uh, avoided costs of having natural gas um, when they're taking a look at the formulas for um, computing costs and efficiency moving forward. So it does benefit our climate action plan. And so staff recommends that city council support Senate Bill 1238. I move to support. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Lago Faring, seconded by Councilmember Martin that we support the bill upon count, uh, city staff's recommendation. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Close, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. The third bill Last. is sort of the same um, uh, vein. House Bill 1253 concerns a general fund transfer to the local government severance tax fund to fund grants to local governments for renewable and clean energy. Currently, DOLA has a plan, um, a program like this to be able to give grants for planning for sustainability programs. We've been part of that in the past. This bill would transfer $5 million from their general fund into these grants for local governments to be able to move forward on sustainability efforts. Um, so because this supports the council's climate action plan, um, city staff recommends that the city council support House Bill 1253. Would like to make a motion. Councilman Martin? I move to support House Bill 1233. I'll second it. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, Thank Senator you, Mayor. Cedar. Thank you very much. All right, let's move on to, all right, so let's, let's mix it up just a little bit. The good news is uh, about this whole wait thing for final call, public invited to be called, or, or anyway, so the good thing is, let's move on to mayor and council comments, but in the meantime, throw up the screen, and if people would like to call in, let's see if we get any, uh, by the time we're done with mayor and council comments, let's see if uh, we get some people who want to speak at public invited to be heard. So if you'd like to speak, call in and let's start now with uh, mayor and council comments. Does anyone want to say anything? 
And if not, then we'll just take a three minute break and we'll wait. I don't uh, speak up if you want to say something because I can't see everybody. Anybody? Um, I, do. I do. Councilwoman right. Peck. Ca Councilmember Peck, why don't you go ahead and, and take the floor? Okay. Um, I, I, want, I don't talk about my children because they're pretty private, but I, uh, my son said I could share this with you because it's kind of important. Um, last, the end of last summer, he, contact, he contracted uh, the COVID virus and became pretty ill. He got over it, but um, he had what is generally known as fog brain, but we decided it was cement brain. Um, and it, it was pretty devastating. Um, and I won't go into any of the details of it. But we, uh, with the recent research and data that came out, it said that if you, if you had had the virus, then you got some antibodies. So you only needed one shot and it would act as the second shot which would give you the added antibodies. So um, needless to say, I was been pretty scared for about nine months for him because of some of the things that happened during this time, time period with his brain. So um, he got the shot on April 5th, last Monday. And um, my other son called and said, have you talked to, to my brother? And he's, he's different. He was totally different. And, um, he was excited. He, he, is, he told me, he said, all this stuff's going on in my head that like it used to. Um, and uh, he's a cyclist and has not been able to get on his cycle, his bicycle at all for nine months. Um, but this weekend, he went on a 90 plus a ride, 90 mile ride with three, over 3,000 feet elevation. Um, I am so excited for him because it, it totally got rid of the lingering effects of the virus. And the reason I am saying this is to the people who are afraid of taking the shot, um, who don't think that it is worthwhile or that it helps, or that or it's a conspiracy theory that the Democrats or the Republicans are doing this or Bill Gates or whatever it is that um, it really works. This is a real thing that we all need to get vaccinated to protect each other. So uh, I'm really excited because Shauna is, is signing up for the, uh, uh, a big ride in August and some little rides in between. And he's so excited about it that he's back. He's got his mojo back. And it was just because of this shot. So this is a message to go out to our residents that we shouldn't be afraid of this. We should just do it and protect everybody. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Peck. And uh, just my comment for the night is I have my first shot scheduled for Monday. So um, I will follow your advice and all my council members examples. So thank you. Council Mayor Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, first of all, I am happy uh, for, for council member Peck and, and her son. So that is a, a great local proof that, that what we've been reading in the national news is accurate. And I'm, I'm just delighted to hear it. Um, I can't help looking back um, to all of the times that we have uh, interviewed people for um, the various city boards and commissions. And I remember when we interviewed people for planning and zoning, um, the question always was asked, will you apply the code exactly as written? And that seems now to be inconsistent with, um, with, a, with the staff's uh, eager promotion of the new codes that they were intended to be flexible. So um, I wonder if we don't need to fix some disconnect because I think we have just, um, you know, reversed what would have been a good project and a good project for the neighborhood. Um, and I am, I am sorry that it had to happen. That's all.
All right, so I do not see anybody's hands up because I'm just going to try to get the first call, the final call taken care of, and then we'll get our screen back. Is there anybody here? Don? Anybody in the queue? Mayor, sorry. Uh, th there is not. Okay, I mean, well, I was trying to get back right. to my other screen there. <laughs> that's right. So let's go ahead and close the okay. final call public invited to be heard and get me my screen back. Anyone else have their hand up anxious to say something? Perfect. That is that. Look, look at that. I'm just look at that. We're just using time left and right effect efficiently. All right. So let's go ahead then. City manager, do you have any remarks? No comments, Mayor Council. Okay. And then Eugene May, do you have any comments? No comments, Mayor. All right, great. Then do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll move. No move. I'll move. Second. Second. <laughs> A move second. second in. Let's go home. No, let's get out of here. All right. It was. Uh, I'll say the motion was made by Councilmember Christensen. It was second by seconded by Councilmember Waters. All in favor, say aye. 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 I'm sorry. Aye. Was that an aye, Councilmember Christensen, or did you have a comment? I just hold my hand up to double. Okay. Anybody yeah. opposed? All right. The motion carries unanimously. We're we are concluded for tonight. We're adjourned. We'll see everybody uh, next week. And then I'll stop by and sign things in the morning. All right. Thanks, guys. Good night.